This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome again to another sunset safari from us here at Safari Live in Juma in the Sabi Sands. My name is Steve. I'm joined on camera by Sebastian, who's had a few nice days off and he's back fresh and we're out. And of course, we have found the Unkuhuma Pride, which apparently crossed out this morning, Seb, but they've now just popped back in. We just thought we'd come and have a quick little look. They're lying down flat in the shade. They haven't gone very far. I'm not sure exactly where James had them crossing out, but we just thought, let's have a quick look. We're on our way to Chitra Dam. Uh, I would like to find some elephants this afternoon. And uh, so we just thought, let's just come have a look at Twin Dam, see if they're around. And here they are, 20 meters from Gowrie, Main. So they're in the shade. And uh, don't forget, folks, this is an interactive safari. Send through your questions, hashtag Safari Live. Chat to us in the YouTube stream. We'd love to hear from you. Unkuhumas are lying flat in the shade. I'm sure they are not going anywhere for the next little while. So we're probably going to continue on with our idea of going to Chitwa. It's a nice warm afternoon. Go then have a look, see what the elephants are up to. I'm sure there's going to be elephants coming down. Well, I'm hoping. And as you know, because it's quite warm, it's 29 degrees Celsius, 85 degrees Fahrenheit. If these lions go anywhere, it's going to be 50 meters or so to the watering hole to have a drink. They're going to plop themselves down again. I'm, I'm assuming it's the Unkuhuma Pride that is, folks. I haven't identified a single individual yet, but uh, by the fact that they are, are here, not far from where James left them this morning. Ah, there we go. I've got the injured lioness just there on the far right. So there's one of the youngsters. You can see by the very pink nose, is enjoying cooling down with a, <laughs> a very open belly. Not sure what these lions got up to last night, but it doesn't seem like they managed to feed. So maybe this evening they'll rise a little bit earlier than they did yesterday with James. James spent a little bit of time with them. There on the far right, Seb, is the injured female. You can just see her bottom. There she is. Here's the most characteristic of the pride. There's no need to look at faces or anything like that. Very nice big scar on the back of her hip makes it very easy to identify. Well, it's not just me out this afternoon. Tristan Dix is out on safari and he would like to wish you a good afternoon. Indeed I am. As Steve mentioned, my name is Tristan. On camera I've got uh, David and it is a very warm welcome because I say warm welcome because it is a very warm afternoon. It's a beautiful, beautiful winter's day and or late winter's day should we say and well we're trying to find Hosanna. Now I know some of you tagged us very kindly in the video of where he went but I'm struggling to actually figure out exactly where that is. Now there's a termite mound that he went towards with a little bit of greenery behind it and I can't actually find that particular termite mound. I roughly know that he came south but I don't know if he went on this side or if he went on the left side so I'm going towards the dam cam because I want to try and turn and try and see if I can see the same image that was off the camera itself but I know that he went towards this bush and so I thought it was off to kind of my left side and if he carried on there but it just doesn't I just don't know if I'm going to be correct so we're going to try and figure out the mystery of where he's gone he hasn't come back to the pan so I know he was here at this particular little spot over here on this bush and he kind of walked along this pathway now I'm trying to see from a dam cam perspective where he would have gone the picture we're looking for basically is a termite mound with a bit of greenery coming out of it and quite a large tree and so I thought it was somewhere up on the top of that ridge over there but I might be mistaken it maybe could be somewhere to the left I just don't see it David do you see that same image I don't see it from here either I suppose the dam cam is a little bit higher than what we are so 
interesting. I'm not sure where exactly it is. Now, I know that the dam cam is frozen at the moment, so I do apologise if any of you have been watching that. Gremlins have been attacking lately, and, well, Conrad's on it and trying to fix it. But I'm pretty sure he went in this direction. Maybe some of you who were watching the dam cam when he left can maybe give us an indication. Did he go on the right side of Twin Dams as the camera is facing, or did he go on the left side of Twin Dam Road back towards the drainage line? Because if he went onto the right side, then I'll just go and scratch around there. But if he's obviously gone onto the left, then I'm going to need to do a bit more work because I'm not sure exactly which way he would have gone and because the Ellies have walked here there's just absolutely no tracks left the Ellies have squashed everything and made an absolute mess of things so I'm thinking that he must have walked on this pathway straight across but I didn't pick up exactly where his tracks have gone over the road which is quite interesting I would have thought I would have found them quite easily crossing this big road here but maybe I'm wrong Megs, anyone helping us or are we are we on our own for this one? If we're on our own, that's okay. We'll try and do it. So Linda, you say another mystery. Oh no, Linda. As much as I like a good bush mystery, it would have been nice to have a simple afternoon with Hosanna, but I suppose one has to... Oh, there his tracks are going this way. I think it looks like his tracks. The problem is there's lion tracks here as well from when the Nkumas walked here yesterday morning. So you've got to kind of check those as well, but we'll try and see. Ah, so... Perfect. So a lot of you are saying he went right, and which is with the way that we're heading at the moment. I know there's a termite mound, but I was, I'm surprised if it's this termite mound in front, which is the only one that's got a bit of green sticking out, then that dam cam sees a lot further than I initially thought, which is, I suppose, a great thing, but also a difficult one to kind of know what's going on, because, you know, from where perspective wise it's always quite tough but he's gone up towards Inga's I wonder if he's gone to go and lounge by the pool maybe he has the Ellie's were there yesterday and so it's very possible that today Osana could be there lounging by the pool I did hear a lot of birds alarm calling when I left this afternoon so it's very possible this just doesn't look like the image that I was sent so I'll scratch around, but while I do that, it sends you back across to Steve, who's on his way towards Chitra Chitra. Yes, we are. Thanks, Tristan. And we just had a bit of a detour. Sorry we've left the lions, folks, but they're not going anywhere. The plan for the afternoon, go follow up on some elephants, see if they are down by the watering hole. Maybe get another hippo fight. That'd be nice. Or how about a wild dog chasing an impala into the dam? That would be fantastic, but uh, we've had to do a bit of a detour because a truck has broken down in the Milwati uh, on the Gary Main drainage. So that is going to cause all sorts of confusion this afternoon. A big sand truck, big truck bringing building materials into, I think, one of the lodges that are being built. And there's a traffic jam of cars not being able to get past. Well, we were able to get past because we were on our property, but that is the main road through, the thoroughfare. It's very blustery. It's a warm blustery, the high, high fire index. The right hand side, you can just kind of see the remnants of, of the, the fire break that was put in, which is very important in case of some runaway fire that potentially could come in. Windy days like this in August are the reason why people put in fire protection. A lot of people wonder, but why do we put fire breaks and why do we do this? And the savannah burns, it's designed to burn. And when you come to August and you see how dry everything is, especially after a few good years of rain and you get enormous amounts of grass, vegetation, standing shoulder high, head high, and then it's dry and this dry wind blowing and you get a spark in there. Sure, that can lead to catastrophe. Because unfortunately, we are people living in the landscape these days. In an ideal world, these landscapes should be enormous. Millions of hectares of uncharted landscape with no people. But that is not the reality, folks. That is not the reality. We do have wild places, but people are still in those wild places. And that's why a lot of the policies with regards to fire revolve around um, protection especially of infrastructure and human life. So enough of that morbid topic out the way. We are approaching the watering hole, which is just down here. 
in the left. Do you feel that as well, Seb? Okay. Well, just give me one moment. I have caught a branch on the car. I just have to quickly disconnect myself. It is making a very funny sound. <clears throat> Elephants like to break these branches off. You can see this is one of the, the weeping wattle has left the leaves completely and uh, has gone for the bark. The beautiful nutrients that that gives. Lots of stomach and abdominal complaints are treated with, with the bark and the elephant has um, chewed it in that corkscrew motion we like to talk about. In it goes, turns, and then clearly he doesn't want any more, discards it on the ground. And I've been dragging it. It was making a funny sound seconds ago. Okay, well, I don't see any elephant from up here, but let's just go down to the bottom. It's one of those days where you can hope to find elephants just streaming in. That would be nice, wouldn't it, Seb? Could even be a day of swimming elephants. That's been a while since I've seen elephants swimming. Some Ellie tracks. I know Tristan is fortunate to see a few Ellie's at Bivelsuk watching all last night with that herd of buffalo. I'm not getting all of those comms there, Meg. So I heard you say something about Rose. Did you hear, Seb? Not really. Yes, Rose, I am hoping to find you some elephant. In these conditions, elephants are the best because um, unlike the lions who are just going to lie there until it cools down, the elephant will actually do something about the weather. And they go in search of, of coolness, in search of moisture. And I mean, by the watering hole, we're going to get a couple birds and a couple hippos. More than a couple. No doubt there will be. I can see the fish eagle on the floor, Seb. Oh, yeah. Over there. First bird. What he's doing on the floor, maybe he's got a or a guinea fowl. Let's just go straight in there to a nice without having to um, chase him off. Just a little bit more there. Oh, no. Made a mistake. That is an Egyptian goose. That just happened. That just happened. I thought an Egyptian goose was a fish eagle. I think I get the naughty badge today. Well, all I saw was the white of the wing with the head down. Okay, should we stop here? Don't even show them the Egyptian goose, Seb. Don't even show them my... Okay, you're going to. You're going to. Seb's just done it. He just put me in it. Now, that Egyptian goose had its head down, and I just saw the white the dark on the back so please do forgive me folks <laughs> absolutely no excuses well let's have a look at the starlings on the right hand side yeah they're all having a very nice drink they are definitely starlings the ones in the top of the picture yes 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 those ones oh, having a bar. beautiful Just like we see our antelope coming down as a group to drink and to, to, to sort of cool themselves down. But on your own, lots of small, medium sized raptors that will take advantage of a bird on their own. Okay. Now it sounds like Steve's got a few gremlins and things playing havoc on his side so hopefully he'll get them sorted out. In the meantime we're up near quarantine. I found the tracks for Hosanna where they've crossed, well I think it's him, crossing over the road and then coming up towards quarantine and so I'm just trying to check if I can find any more sign of him anywhere up here. Now we're going to take a little road that goes towards Ingers itself because there should be tracks theoretically coming out. And I was saying earlier, I had lots of birds alarm calling and making quite a bit of noise. And so I wonder if he didn't pop out somewhere in this section. The problem is, is that 
both myself and Seb drove here this afternoon in coming down for game drive and so we could very well have squashed all of the tracks. The last time I heard the birds was just over here on my left hand side so I was hoping maybe he's somewhere in this general vicinity. Just double checking he hasn't walked into Ingers because he's been doing that of late. No, nothing there. Let's check on this side. I don't see any sign of his tracks here. It's not to say that he hasn't been here. It's difficult because getting an exact kind of, I mean, thank you to those that did send through where he went. Oh, that's, hang on a second. What track is that? It looks like almost like Tundi or Tlalumba's track that's come past here as well. I wonder if they didn't walk past here last night. Not very fresh though, that particular track, but it's too small for Hosanna. So where would he have gone? Wait, what's this on the road here? There's trucks on the road. Uh, they now look like they've gone off. So they're going up and down here. I wonder if he's not sitting somewhere here. I see tracks kind of going behind us now. <sighs> Wasana, where are you? are you? I've had this funny feeling he's right here somewhere and I just can't see him. That's what I'm getting. Because I see a track that's coming underneath the car going back that way. Now we know he likes to walk around down towards sort of Philemon's dip area. So it's very possible that he's gone somewhere here. Let's try to check if he's not crossed, but there's definitely a track for a female leopard, a small female leopard that's come across here. So just on my right hand side, David, I don't know if you can see it there. It's coming over the road and crossing into off the edge. I'm just trying to see, sorry, there's so much glare on my monitor. There it is. So that's for a female leopard. It's a very small female leopard. So I would say that's Clalumba's track. And it looks like Tundi's track coming down this road as well. Now I'm not sure if anyone drove here this morning, but it is on top of most of the vehicle tracks going into this block here, so I wonder where they went. It's not the track we're looking for though, that's not Hosanna's. I'm gonna have to go back I think to where Hosanna's track actually is and maybe just try to follow with the vehicle on that track itself. But interesting that Tandy, I don't know, I wasn't out this morning so I don't know if Steve and James saw these tracks this morning and somehow, you know, if they were called in and actually followed on. I think probably the Lions took the majority of the attention away from what was going on. So maybe, just maybe, that's why they weren't tracked. But interesting, I wonder where they ended up because yesterday apparently James said to me she was quite highly strung and moving very, very fast. Um, both Tundi and Clalumba, so I wonder where they've ended up from today, but it definitely looks like they're tracks that go that way. I'm pretty sure they're from last night. They're not from during the day today, I don't think. So Steve says he doesn't, he didn't see any female leopard tracks. I doubt any of the guys would have unless they drove this particular road. Nothing there, nothing there. Okay, um, we're gonna have to go back to where Hosanna's last tracks are and just drive in on the tracks and try and follow them track for track using a car, which is always easier said than done. And it's not very, very easy to do, especially while we're live and talking to you guys. I know that sounds horrible, but it's true. It's very difficult to talk to you and see the camera as well as see the tracks. It kind of the reason why is because you have to kind of lie out the car a little bit to try and see the tracks and actually get them nicely but we're going to try it let's see if we can do a live leopard track this is how it's this is see how it goes i mean it's going to be an interesting test of whether or not we can actually get it right i think we can what do you think david yes let's try okay well i know exactly where the last track is so i'm just going to get round back to that area doesn't look like he's come out but it looks like she's moved around and he might be just hanging around somewhere close to Inga's. In fact he could even be inside Inga's. The other night he was seen sitting at one of the taps and drinking 
little drops of water out of the tap and was standing between Sebastian's room and where I stay. So I don't know what he was up to there, but he was hanging around there the other night and Alex actually saw him. So I wonder if he's not gone back. Maybe he's decided it's time for a pool day and he's going to just take it easy. Now, sorry, Megs, I forgot the name. Can you just repeat the name there, please? I'm trying to think of 20 things. Del Rez, you say he's going to find us. Yes, well, that would be nice. Come on, Hosanna. Yeah, boy. It'd be nice if he did. Yesterday he found us, for sure. We, there was no way that we found him. I and mean, we had an idea he might go to Buffalzook Dam, but there was very little skill involved in what happened yesterday. I just found his tracks heading in that direction and threw a Hail Mary pass and went there. And we were so busy looking at things like um, Buffalo that we didn't look over our shoulders and he was actually right there I think we probably just drove right past him where he ended up sitting last night when we left him on the termite mound was in an area where you know had you not paid attention and not really kind of looked hard you would have easily easily driven past him right now theoretically his tracks are somewhere here. Where did I come out? I came out somewhere in front and I saw the tracks going over the road. The problem with this area at the moment is there's so many tracks from different leopards because he's walked around here. Tingana was here last night as well. So I came out here and theoretically he has crossed. Where did I see those tracks, David? Further on, you say. Yes, I don't want to drive over too many of them. Is this them here? So here we go. They're on the road here. Now where do they go from there? I'm sure I saw them cross over the road here somewhere. Okay, so they were on the road. Now I've lost them as to where did they go. Here they are still again. So we're going to try and pick it up exactly where they go over. Okay, so I've lost them now completely. So they must have cut off the road here. Right, so let's take this and see if maybe he's not lying in a bush somewhere over here. Now while we do that, let's send you across to Steve, who apparently has a bird now to show all of you and well, hopefully has no more gremlins. So all the gremlins are gone. We've decided to leave Chitwa. There's some issue with signals, so we're just going to go out of there for the moment while they deal with that. And we found you a bird that is not a fish eagle. It is not Egyptian goose either. It is a grey or African grey hornbill, which some of you out there, you know who you are, absolutely love. So there we go. There's a nice bird for you for the day. It's not often we get to see them. And uh, the question is sometimes is posed. Why do we not see as many of the African grey hornbills as we see the yellow-billed and the red-billed, both of the southern? And that is because these guys actually do very, very well in tall Mapani woodland. They like, for some reason, the Mapani. It's kind of maybe a, a niche habitat separation between the other two species. You do find them down here, but they're nowhere near as popular as the other two. And uh, that's got to do with probably nesting sites. Uh, the hornbills li live in cavities and trees, and maybe these guys just have a favorite for um, Mapani woodland. Who knows why? Oh, he's enjoying. That is the tree the elephant was eating, the weeping wattle. And he is looking in there quite deliberately for some insects. Quite specialist feeders, or not should I say specialist, but quite well adapted their feeding. Karen, you've never seen a grey? Well, we do try and capture them on camera, but they are nowhere near as popular as the other two, as I was saying. But uh, hornbills, they are very popular down here in southern Africa. No need to migrate because they've got very, very good adaptations. That beak is able to do all sorts of things. So, first of all, you can see his feet are adapted to holding him in the tree. He's looking around. He's physically plucking insects off of the branches. He doesn't have much of a hawking sort of ability, what you see with the forktail drongo or bee eaters. It will sit, fly off, catch and land, sit, fly off, catch and land. Hornbills don't have that, but they can walk on the ground as well. They can pick up termites. They can sift through the leaflets and through all of the dung piles from elephants and rhino looking for insects. And they can also look in bark cavities. And so they do have the ability to feed on quite a wide range of food, including fruits, and quite a strong beak so they can break open those sort of harder husks as well 
and I've even seen one eating a mouse before, which was quite strange. I didn't know how long it, it, we left him with it. He was wiping it and wiping it and wiping it, and maybe it was roadkill. I'm not sure, but they're known to eat things up to the size of lizards and mice and being quite the omnivore. And there we go. He's just exited stage right. Fantastic. Well, we're back on Druma. We're going to head up towards Bufazuk watering hole now. Mrs. Zero. 177 that's fantastic mrs zero keep on tallying it's nice to be able to get a new bird in the winter months very very good my uh, my phone got updated and uh, it de deleted my bird my bird lists <laughs> i got all these wonderful bird lists from all the places i've been on my phone of course and um, all the old school people out there would be like, well, you should have kept it written down, Steve. I was like, well, I had most of it written down. It's all in my head. I know if I go through it, I'll be able to add it again. But anyway, we'll get it. We'll get it back. Nice to keep those lists. Woo! James Henry has just laid down the challenge, ladies and gentlemen. He would like to know if I can find the first Wahlbergs. Well, that's a good question. The spring is coming. A picture that was posted this morning from a friend of mine, Duncan McKenzie. The first star chestnut down in the, the Nelspreet area, area has flowered. When I was at Hoodspreet the other day, I saw some uh, knob thorns that flowered. So maybe in the next few weeks, I think, I think maybe we're still a little bit too early. A little bit too early, but I'll take that challenge. Chances are it's probably going to come when I go and leave and then someone else is going to win. But anyway, I'd love to find you the first Wahlbergs. I've only seen them in September, so I think it's too early, but who knows? With climate change, what we're seeing is the need for these birds to migrate north and migrate south is kind of being delayed, and that's why birds are such a good indicator of climate change. Why leave an area if there's still food? Here we go. Here's possibly another bird. Not that one, the one on the ground there. Oh, Seb, he's going. Well, we'll get this one here. He wants to, he wants to pose. Oopsie. Here we go, he's still there. Can you get him? Here we go, that's one of the starlings again. Unlikely ones that were, one of the ones that was bathing before, but he's cleaning his beak. Beautiful orange eye, the greater blue-eared starling. And you see, he's just got that darkish sort of patch behind the ear. The, the colors that you see in the feathers are carotenoids and melanin, what gives, that, um, what gives that reflective sort of color. There's not actually a reflective color. It's just the way that the pigments work in the feathers, the way they reflect the light. If you see him in, um, in low light, they actually appear to be black. And so the different starling species that you have, just the slight changes in the angle that they have, uh, is what oh he's he's giving me the stare down Seb did you see that this actually looks like a cape glossy starling oh I can't really tell he doesn't really have that darker patch behind the ear Tracy they are very cute beautiful colors and that reflection uh, obviously helps with a lot of sort of cooling because uh, a lot of the the heat that sort of lands on their body just gets pushed away. We've seen on the thermal camera with the fleur how these birds are insulated. So the feathers don't just keep them warm, they also keep them cool. Um, so the, the, the heat of the day doesn't really penetrate them too much. That's why you can see some of these birds sitting in the heat of the day on the top of a tree just cooking, as you will. Yes, that is a great blue-eared starling. You see that dark patch below, just behind the ear that is what gives it away. A beautiful orange eye. Why they have orange eyes is very hard to say. The Birchall starling doesn't. they got a black eye and a longer tail. So maybe a lot of it's got to do with mate recognition. Hard to say. Okay. Rosh is back. Let me quickly open it up. I'll first have to give my, my phone a little wipe. And uh, I'll open my app and the starlings, the Cape Glossy Starling, which looks very similar to this one, if you just give me a moment. The Birchill Starling is very easy, very, very easy. I'll show you why. <coughs> okay, well, here's a picture. 
Here's a picture of him. Very long tail, black eye, very easy to see. But now if I show you, sorry Seb, I'm just gonna to have to push the button, bird family. These are all the starlings that you have here. Very hard to really get a good look at them. But if you look closely, individuals have got orange eyes or don't have orange eyes. And the Birchels and the Meaves starling both have long tails and they don't have long eyes. And the, the rest generally do. So the distribution is quite a good way. The greater blue eared, which is this one over here, I'm going to show you. He's just got that broad sort of ear covert, that darkness just behind the ear that we were talking about. It's not very easily seen in this light, I'm afraid. Sorry, I'm going to try to show you a photo. Photos tend to work a little bit better. Very hard to see though, sometimes, but they've got a bit more of a greenish blue to them. And then the, the Cape Glossy. So if I click this lovely button, we get the similar birds. Oh, I'm just going to ch <laughs> turn my phone to the side. I'm terribly sorry. Cape Glossy, that one. And then we compare. Okay, so there's the Cape Glossy Starling. And what it says here in the description. Oh, I've got a spider on my leg. That's okay. I'm not afraid of spiders. Okay, it's gone. What it says in the description here is it lacks the dark ear covert. It lacks that darkness behind the ear. So that is the major thing that you're looking for. Um, but it also is a bit more blue in the plumage where that one has got a bit more of a greenish blue to it. And it's got that broad thing at the back. So the, the lovely thing about this app is I can show you a picture of each one at the same time. And they do look... Oh, the light is not great. I'm sorry, Seb. I'm sorry about that. Sometimes that's why books are good, isn't it? Anyway, that's why you've got to look long and hard. And if you're not sure, well, then uh, a call is always a good one. And uh, the Cape Glossy Starlink sounds very differently, very differently. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened to my English. Here is the uh, Greater Blue Ed Starling. So calls sometimes are quite interesting. And have a listen to my hat. Now these guys are all around camp. They're very popular in this area. Okay, now we get rid of him. And let's go to the next one. Sorry. There we go. Cape Glossy. You hear the difference? It's easy. It's more of a chirping high pitch. Repetitive. Where the other one I actually confused for a white fronted bee eater. It's got that very squeaky, like it's got halloumi cheese in the mouth. The first one does sound busy, does sound busy. Okay, well, we're going to keep heading up on this uh, fire break here. I think we might get some nice birds. And up to Bufflesook Dam, we want to show you some more because I think there's going to be elephants. In the meantime, let's go back over to Tristan and see if he's had any signs of the little chief. Well, we found his tracks. He's gone towards quarantine and from there the tracks have just been destroyed by multiple different vehicles that have driven over it. So that's myself and Seb and everybody going up and down from Ingers has caused those tracks to be obliterated. But we have elephants that are going, making quite a bit of a noise to the south in the Mulwati. So I wonder if maybe, just maybe, Hosanna is not somewhere this side. He's done maybe a loop and has come back towards the Mulwati. Maybe he's tracking Tanya and Tlalamba's tracks. I'm not sure. So I just want to quickly come and see why these Ellies are so upset about life and what they're busy screaming about. Like I heard them once and I brushed it off as maybe just a baby that wanted milk, but they've done it again and again. So I just want to come and make 100% sure that we're not missing anything. Now to me they sound like they're somewhere down in below here. David is behind the camera pointing at me saying yes, he believes the same somewhere in here. So we're gonna try and just check. So Lit Piano, who is a new viewer to our show, welcome. And I hope that you are going to love your journey with Safari Live and that you'll ask lots and lots of questions and continue to watch for many years to come. It, basically a, a herd of elephants, well a group of elephants is called a herd, quite simply. They, that is the sort of generally, or generally accepted term for a group of elephants, is a herd of elephants. And there is probably a fancy collective noun, but 
it's definitely a herd is what we would accept mostly now i just got a word from aubrey he's just picked up Osana's tracks again going so megan you say a trumpet of elephants i quite like that megs very very nice i enjoy that one so that would be very very good i like that david you got any suggestions hmm any of you any viewers what do you guys think we should call a group of elephants what do you think would be a nice name for a group of ellies i think i like a trumpet trumpet sounds pretty cool maybe there's some others we can come up with as a collective for there's the ellies there i found them which is good news so talking about elephants this is a good sign they don't look too distressed already from here they look as though they are pretty relax so maybe it was just a baby like I initially thought David I'm going to go down and up so hold on two seconds it's got to go down slowly one doesn't want to frighten the elephants sorry makes us repeat that Jen says a parade of Ellie's Ah, parade of Ellie's. Yes, that's that makes sense too, doesn't it? It's, they definitely do like to parade about when they're in groups. I would agree with that as well. Guy incognito, a trample. I like that too. That's very cool. It's almost like a crash of rhinos, which is the collective noun for rhinos. Is a crash. So I like that one. That one makes sense to me as well. Now, here's our Ellie right here. Rosh, a festival. That's probably the best one. I really like that. The Festival of Ellie's sounds very good because they often are quite playful and festive, particularly if they're at water. So they go quite crazy when they're at water. Now, I wonder if it's not this little baby that is the one making all the noise just now because it's suckling and maybe mom wasn't stopping and that's why it was making quite a bit of noise. But you can see it's little trunk between the legs there. Look at that. <laughs> tiny, tiny little trunk in comparison to its mom. Its mom is a beautiful elephant. She's got big, long, straight tusks. Very similar to, to that of a elephant out of East Africa. So the Mara elephants often have these long, straight tusks. Probably longer than that. But I've seen her around many times. She's a, part, a member of a herd that we see quite regularly. Often spending time around the Mulwati system. Go to Chitwa quite a bit. So I've seen them there fairly often as well but they all look very relaxed far too relaxed to have come across a predator in the last little bit because if they had and us coming up here we would have had them kind of open ears straight away and they would have paid uh, quite a bit of attention towards us now i'm just going to try and reposition so that david's actually got a view here because i've not given him much to work with sorry david she was out when we first started in my defense Ah, so Ingrid, you're asking if it's true that Ellie's visit the graves of their loved ones. So, no, I mean, there, there isn't a grave for elephants, so that is a fallacy. Elephants don't go to a place to die and, and, and don't certainly don't have graves that are organized where they can go to. But what happens with Ellie's is that a lot of elephants, particularly ones that die of old age, they will end up going into areas with soft vegetation. Now, normally those areas are riverbed sections. And so you often get a grouping of elephants together that die on a river course and with floods and various other things. So bones will get washed into the same place and it looks like multiple Ellie's have died in a similar area. But that's not actually the case. They've all died spread out, but it kind of bones have been washed together. And maybe that's where this kind of myth of elephant graveyard started but what you will find with Ellie's is if they come across a skeleton of an another elephant or a dead body for another elephant they will go and investigate it and they might come past their random times especially if it's on their way to water courses or feeding grounds that they particularly enjoy it's not always the case I mean sometimes you'll find that they don't go back for years there used to be an elephant carcass close to Chitwa camp and it was about a year that the Ellie's regularly would go past there and it was on the main route to the dam and so they used to go there quite regularly sniff around it was very interesting to watch that there was this tactile kind of function where they would pick up bones and they would sniff and smell and everyone was very very quiet but they after a year when the bones started to get really scattered by hyenas it kind of just 
just died down. We hardly then saw elephants going into that area as much as what we did in the first year. So I don't think that they regularly visit an area where there is a dead elephant. They won't go there every kind of few months just to go and check in. It's more a case that if they come past it, they definitely will investigate and there's some sort of intelligence there to know that, hang on a second, this is a dead individual from you know, a herd or, or of our species and they'll sniff and they'll smell and maybe they can pick up a scent there that tells them who that individual was at some point. But as time goes and weathering happens and, you know, so bones break down, it's going to become almost impossible for these guys to recognize, you know, a shard of bone in amongst all the others. So definitely I wouldn't imagine that they go and visit it regularly. Uh, you know, you, I've never seen elephants go to the same place year in, year out, other than for water. Um, definitely not carcasses and there are many carcasses that are spread around the Kruger Park system and, and I mean they will investigate it while it's still fairly fresh and while the kind of bones are around and a prime example of that is the bull elephant that died at Twin Dams. We saw for three months um, that was pretty kind of you know I mean it was it was active and Ellie's went past but now not very much going on so you know it's it's an interesting take on them. They obviously are intelligent enough to know what's going on, but they don't regularly go to the same place. But how nice is it to have so many Ellie's back again? It just shows you, as soon as it's hot weather, hot dry weather is always a great sign for Ellie's. You'll find them, as soon as that weather gets warmer, they come out in their droves. And when it's cold, overcast, blustery conditions, then, well, Ellie's are not that plentiful. can hear they're all busy feeding at the moment lots of them are slapping grass up against their chest just getting rid of any soil that may be on it particularly this female she's quite active and it seems like quite a nice large herd I can look if I look around there's quite a few gray bodies kind of in between all of the vegetation here so there's at least just counting them there's at least 10 that I can see off the bat so it seems like a fairly decent sized herd which is quite nice Right, well we'll stay with our Ellie's, it's you know, a beautiful animal and so we might as well spend some time with them while we think about where we're going to find Hosanna and in the meantime let's send you back across to Steve who's got something that Hosanna might like to hunt. Yes, well we are watching a female steambok. She's just scratched a hole in the ground, she's just defecated the pellets and now she's burying it. Isn't that gorgeous? Now the angle that she's using, quite interesting to note because if you look at the tracks you'll be able to see that in those tracks they move in, they show a V-like shape from the front and you can actually see that now in the movement of her feet and the male's tracks interestingly enough when he does that actually form a parallel line not a V-shape. So that's something that I learned long ago from a tracking point of view. I've never actually seen it happen from the female side. I saw a male do it a little while ago and I went and took a photo after he left and it was square. And now seeing that female do it um, and she did the V. So I'm very happy that that information that I've shared before has now, in my opinion, been proven. And she's on the fire break looking for the most delicate of delicacies growing out of the burnt patch. King Fire is your favorite antelope. It's a beautiful little antelope and look how she's digging. That's what's interesting about Steenbok is that they're able to dig for their nourishment. They can dig up bulbs and roots and things that they might want to feed on. Uh, they're very selective in their feeding and very cute. And there were actually two females here, which is quite strange. Maybe the one was her daughter and hasn't quite left the roost yet. It's always hard to identify a juvenile. Ooh, what have you got there? Found something tasty. The daughter wasn't as relaxed as this one is. She is being super relaxed. There we go. She's hiding now. And indeed... Hosanna would enjoy a steenbok, so would Tundi. But I, these are one of my favorite antelopes. They are so pretty. We never get a bit of a twitch in her right leg there. We never get to, to film them like this. They are normally quite shy. And See, I've got my back to hers because I'm looking at the monitor, so she's not too bothered by me. So when, when Seb turns, he's got to be very careful that his movement and the big lens of the camera doesn't indicate to her that she's been spotted. 
You see, she's kind of behaving as if, okay, cool, they're not looking at me. Yes, Linda, they do have a very little face with enormous eyes. And how cute is that nose? That big, long, black stripe there, the purpose of which I have absolutely no idea. Maybe it adds to some form of camouflage. But see, so she's... I don't know what exactly she's munching on there, but it's possible that the the grasses that have... Um, is there a tree? Yeah, that's possible she's feeding on some of the leaves that have fallen off of that tree. It's also possible that she's being very selective and feeding on some new growth that has... Oh, there we go. Nice scratch on the head. If I was a boy, I'd have horns growing there. Oopsie. There we go. Off into the bushes. And her strategy is to run and then stand very still. And that is what works for leopards. And for cameramen, it seems. <laughs> and just like that, she is gone. Well, that was fantastic. Spending that time with a very cool little animal. And on that note, let's go to Tristan and his very big animals. Well, we are still with our big animals, and they've come as close as you could ever want to be to a herd of elephants. They're sitting all We've got a group like this, they're so relaxed. You're in this kind of drainage line where it's quiet, beautiful afternoon. And there's not a breath of wind this afternoon either, and they're just kind of sitting about all over the place. Very, very pleasant. You can just kind of hear them rustling as they feed and go about their business. And I must be honest, I'm quite content sitting here. It's very, very pleasant. Gurav, you're asking if it's true if elephants cry. Well, I mean, I've never seen an elephant actually cry. I'm, I mean, it's possible that they secrete out of their eyes. I'm pretty sure that they do. Obviously, if there's dust and things like that, there will be some secretion. You can see that this particular elephant, if you look just behind its eye, so David, if you can go a little bit there, there we go, there's a little secretion coming out just behind the eye, which is from its temporal gland. Now, the temporal gland is an indication of emotion and normally they will secrete out of that when they're in a heightened level of emotion. You've got some blood on your ear little one so often, not often that you can get that close to an Ellie so you can just see as it's flapping away there. No don't move your ear so much. There, There's a little blood that is on there and quite a nasty neck out of the ear but I mean this elephant is no more than I mean half a meter from where we are. You can see I'm trying to actually get out of the way but it's proving to be quite difficult because well, that's where it is right there, which is quite crazy. And now it's going to come past me. So, David, I'm going to try to get out the way. It's going to prove quite difficult. But, I mean, this, as close as you could ever get towards an eye of an elephant is there. In fact, that's the front of the car that you see. What are you doing right here? Hmm? This is ridiculous. Had I wanted to there, I honestly think that it was so close that we would have easily been able to have touched that elephant, which is pretty ridiculous when you think about it. I mean, if I put my foot out, that's pretty much where that elephant walks now, so it's not that far away, is it? It's quite close. You're a very trusting elephant. Considering that it's a younger elephant, I wouldn't have thought it would have come that close. And not one little bit of nonsense, no ears out, no anything as it came past. That was quite surreal, actually. Very, very cool. There's a little baby that's walking through the thicket as well. So, Mina Mu, the elephants do communicate with their trumpet. Most definitely they will communicate with their trumpet. Their trumpet is a huge warning sound to everybody that something is going on. I mean, it's their, probably their most vocal and their biggest communication that they have. They will communicate with their feet by rocking feet back and forth and those kind of things, but those are subtle cues to the herd. The real big message when it's basically like, think about this, it's when you're sitting and you're at home and you're just talking to family members and you'll just kind of have a casual conversation and you won't really you know make too much of a noise about it but when you're really wanting to get somebody's attention you shout don't you so you can equate their movements of their feet and their little growl and rumbles as them just talking generally amongst the herd and then when they trumpet like that that's them shouting to make sure that everybody is hearing them and everybody is getting the message that they're trying to portray and trying to get across and so that's how it is I mean their trumpet is most definitely hugely important to their communications and they use it quite regularly it's how we often hear elephants as we hear a trumpet going out and that's always trying to express a very strong motion to any
any of the other elephants around them. Now, the other thing that's interesting about communication and with their feet and, and all of the other kind of things that we've been talking about is that actually their trumpets and their feet will go hand in hand at some point. And I say that because their feet have sensory cells in them and those sensory cells are able to pick up vibrations caused by sound waves. So they reckon that elephants' feet are so sensitive that things like trumpets and grumbles and rumbles, they are going to travel so far that they'll be able to pick it up at least 15 kilometers away, which when you think about 15 kilometers over terrain like this, it's pretty astounding that they're able to pick that up. And so a trumpet would possibly be heard via the feet. So even though the feet do a little bit of communicating, for those massive ears, it's pretty amazing how sophisticated their systems are to be able to talk to one another and it's because these guys roam massive distances. There was a study that was done recently that showed that the elephants here in the crew in in the Sabi sands are moving a lot more than we think. We always think that they come in and they go towards the sand and Sabi river and they spend their time in that area and that they don't move too much from there. It's not the case. Some of the elephants were shown that they would come into the Sabi sands there goes a tree and they would move into the river system they would have water drink feed and at night they would move and some of them were doing close to 60 kilometers in a day at, or during the course of the night and day and then back again so we would see them the next day and think oh they were here all the time but they've actually traveled this massive loop into Kruger National Park and back again over the course of the night which is quite amazing so depending on conditions depending on food availability these guys will move massive massive distances a lot more than we ever thought which is pretty insane they're a very very cool species right I'm gonna just reposition here because at the moment we can't really see too much so I'm gonna try and get myself into a better area for David as well. David, that's one of the closest elephant encounters we've had in a long time, eh? Oh, it was very nice. I quite, I quite enjoyed that actually, if I'm honest. Now, it's not something that you should do very often, and the only reason that we were able to get away with that and not have any bad consequences is because well, we just sat still with the elephants far away and they then slowly made their way towards us. We had in no way made them feel uncomfortable. It was their decision to come close and when they come close like that in a little one with no ears it's just important just to stay fairly quiet, not move too much and you can see it doesn't disturb them too much. Right, now while I try and reposition, let's send you back across to Steve, who I think is at Bufflesoak Dam now. Coming. We almost at Bufflesoak Dam. We just got to move a little roadblock out of the road here quickly. If you just give me a moment. An elephant broke this down out of the apple leaf tree. Very strong elephant, and I'm going to show you how strong I am. It's not that heavy. Now while they were breaking it down, broke it off here. Why would they break it? There's no feeding sign on the branch. It's just a probably a young bull who was with the herd. There's lots of tracks coming up the road here. Probably a young bull was with the herd. It was just like <laughs> they do that sometimes. They get a bit excited with life and I've had that some I've had that in a sighting before where a young bull smashed four or five small knob thorns around me just to like to, to show the ladies how strong he is. Look how strong I am. Look how strong I am. Didn't feed on them. Just showing us how strong he is. I'm a big uh, supporter of getting out and moving branches and cutting if you can. You work in some places and people will drive around that. They will not get out the car. They'll drive around until <laughs> <laughs> or you can drive over some of the branches, but don't drive around them. Don't drive around because that just causes an erosion problem in an area where the roads are managed. Oh, it's a slender mongoose just ran across the road there. Sheila, let me answer your question in a second. See if we can catch this uh, slender mongoose. It's not often that you get to see them. Oh, he's just here, Seb. He's just here in the long grass. Can you see him? Yeah. There he is, hello. He thinks we can't see him. He's busy sniffing. Whoops, there he goes. They're very fast. That very long tail with a black tip on the end. That's all you really get to notice. I mean, if, if any mongoose ran across the road, you're looking for size, and then you look for, for that tail. And that long tail, being on their own, very good indicator. 
he's a little predator. It's not as a few months ago that Scott and Dave were out and they got that slender mongoose and that black mamba and that scrub hair sighting. That was fantastic. I remember watching that broadcast afterwards. I think the slender mongoose was fighting the snake and the, then the slender mongoose tackled the snake and then tried to steal the scrub hair that the snake had killed and then the snake came back and tried to ingest the whole scrub hair and then I thought that how are you going to ingest that thing it was huge and eventually after a really big effort he uh, he regurgitates it oh there he goes again oh he's gone it's just through here just through those two trees oh he's there somewhere he's standing very still oh not easy to see not easy to see there he goes Anyway, and so then the, the black mum eventually regurgitated the, the scrub hair, uh, and which I thought was going to happen, but I thought, wow, this would be something to see. I mean, the scrub hair is about this thick and the snake's about this thick. So imagine getting that in your belly. That would be a food belly of note. Uh, and then it's just left, and I have no doubt that then probably, well, I can't say I have no doubt, but Slender Mongoose probably came back and had his fill of the scrub hair. So, very interesting things that happen out here yeah? can happen at any stage you never know remember we are 100 percent live coming from the african wilderness sheila you want to know about um how do the animals get enough nutrition out of the vegetation well while we talk about it we can look at a beautiful bird up in the tree there which is white crested helmet trike southern white crown trike my mistake i always get those names confused in my head both are cooperative breeders. White crowned, southern white crowned shrike. They are insect eaters, predatory. So, the nutri nutrients out here, some of the grasses actually hold a fair bit of their nutrients, but not an enormous amount. So, what you find this time of year is, is animals such as bulk grazers, hippos, rhinos, zebras. Uh, not bulk but hind gut fermenters animals that don't re-chew their food they do okay because there's there's a lot of grass here i mean if we just go to this this little corner here we have a little scan through there there is there is still a lot of grass through there it's just it's not the tastiest of grass it's very dry uh, there's lots of it though and so your your bulk grazers that are hind gut fermenters they feed on twice as much of that as the other animals do and they seem to do okay because most of the the breakdown happens by microbial and fermentation in their hind gut and so they they do okay but it's the ruminants that have to take the stuff and rechew and rechew to make it smaller and smaller and smaller and it's only microbial breakdown they don't get as much and so they tend to lose condition especially when you look at kudu and you're exclusively the browsing species the leaves disappear and the nutrients disappear with them uh, so if you've had a very bad year there's not many trees around they do very badly you see the condition fading but that's how survival of the fittest works we don't feed the animals out here so the weak will die and the weak will not breed next year so that strength gene that comes forward with regards to animals being strong and being able to survive well then that is exactly how it works but animals that we're talking about hind gut fermenters that feed on bulk elephants are the most selective and the most successful well, they are indeed steve they are incredibly good at their job and it's been quite interesting sitting with this herd because they were coming exactly where i'm parked now and they've all just done an about turn and kind of gone into this i suppose they weren't coming exactly where i am i mean they were on the edge of the thicket here and they were looking like they were going to angle off further to the south but they've all kind of turned now and now they're going further to the sort of northeast i wonder if they just didn't come into this area to feed and they know that to get water they're going to have to head back either towards the pan or maybe towards Buffalzook dam because that's kind of the two options that they've got right now they probably i wouldn't say equidistant but they are in that kind of zone so those are the two options that they're going to have to come across if they would like to get water and so maybe that's why they've gotten here they know that there's lots of food in this area they're going to feed around look for all kinds of different types of food that occurs in the Mawati drainage line I'm pretty sure some of them have been tucking into jackalberry fruits during the course of the day lots of other little types of trees around as well so I um, wonder if that's what's going to happen 
eat and then back to the pan because this herd came from the pan they had been drinking where the damn camel is and eventually then decided to turn and kind of go back well come down this side and now go back in that direction so it'll be interesting if they do make another appearance the dam cam was so well the nest cam should i say was so much fun today i sat in the nest cams most of the morning and i had a wonderful time i had a leopard which is always obviously makes my day so even though i wasn't on drive this morning i did get to see a leopard vicariously through the nest cam which is always wonderful and hasana was here normal self in that he posed beautifully drank water chased and yala it was all pretty epic and then short trunk came down and she decided to drink right at one camera and her trunk was there and there was water being sprayed towards the cameras it was absolutely fun i thoroughly enjoyed my morning hopefully a lot of you caught those broadcasts too and, and enjoyed them as well and i believe i think james did another elephant sighting a little bit later in the day which was also pretty cool which must have been these ellies that we found now these are the ones that must have come down a little bit later around sort of lunchtime for us or around one-ish, two-ish, somewhere there. But they're all kind of just milling about. I suppose it's actually not really much of a direction that any of them are taking at this stage. They're all just taking it very easy. Our most relaxed elephant in the world is on our back left at the moment. He's just milling about. He's, I think it's a boy. He looks like a boy. He's just kind of taking it very, very easy and spending his kind of afternoon just having a little sleep you can see the aerial is in the way so we're not going to spend too much time on him but hopefully he'll come back this way Lev, I mean, there must be some taste buds. Uh, of course, well, there is, of course, taste buds in them. I, I, whether or not they're as sophisticated as ours, I doubt. Um, obviously, we can pick up so many different tastes, and we are accustomed to so many different foods that, are, you know, that helps. With things like lion and leopard, I mean, their taste bud must be severely muted because when you start eating rotten meat, you can't have great taste buds because otherwise, surely, and maybe they just like the taste of rotten meat. I suppose there's people that like the taste of all kinds of random things out in the world and so maybe it's just an acquired taste and growing up that's all they know but I'm pretty sure that there are taste buds on 99.9% .9 of all mammals tongues they are probably the structured very similar to us but I don't think they'd be nearly as sophisticated as what we've got in ours I, I would imagine baboons and monkeys would have very good taste bud sets um, maybe even elephants the elephants you know they're animals that are very quick to grab any sort of fruit that has got any sweetness to it if you had a bag of oranges now and you chuck them onto the ground these ellies would go crazy they would absolutely love it watermelons as well melons in general they go any crazy for any kind of juicy sweet fruit and especially in the winter months it's why they're a big pain to citrus farmers because most of the time here in, in South Africa particularly citrus is a winter fruit so we get all of our citrus coming out in the winter and so on the borders of the Kruger on the southern boundary around the Crocodile River and then into that area there's quite a few citrus farms and unfortunately the ellies get into there and just cause havoc they go crazy with them and the baboons and so you've got to be a bit careful with that you can imagine it's a dry environment out here very little food and then there's these big laden fruit trees full of juicy tasty vitamin c filled goodness and so i'm not surprised that they go there it's almost like putting you in a desert and then putting a bar in front of you with any drink that you like and any food that you like and then just kind of saying you're not allowed to go there it's not going to work very well is it so you know they they like those kind of things anything that's sweet that they enjoy and that must mean that they can actually taste when it's quite sweet now I'm just trying to think what I'm gonna do I might actually carry on now and just see I mean they're going into an area that I'm not going to be able to off-road in very nicely without actually chasing them which I don't really want to do they've been so kind to us and been so nice and spent a lot of time around the car so I don't want to really push them so while I think about where I'm gonna go and if I'm going to leave them or not let's send you across to Steve who apparently has now finally arrived at Bilfordswood Dam yes I have the unmistakable buffalo weaver nests perched over Bovelsuk Dam and unlike yesterday that Tristan had all those animals there is not a single animal around the watering hole I saw one blacksmith lapwing somewhere and uh, a turtle dove flew in but that is the way it works out here you can get animals moving down you can get animals in their droves drinking Scuba Steve could be here entertaining having a pool party but after Tristan's discussion, are oh, there some Aramark babblers on the other side there, Seb? Can you can you reach them? 
Hello, Peter Viper. Are you wondering about large flocks? Well, the largest recorded flocks of birds in the world are the red-billed quelia, and they do move through. I haven't, I didn't experience them here in Juma when I was here for this last summer, but in places in the Kruger and up in the north and in Mashatu in Botswana, where I've worked, I've had some amazing sightings of just millions and millions of these birds flying through, uh, breeding quite close to where I was as well. An uh, enormous noise that they make, but they like very, very nutrient-rich soil because of the grasses that it provides with the seeds. They're a seed-eating bird. They also nice. They come down and nest in very dense areas, not dense areas, but thorny sort of scrub, knob thorn felt in Sangita in the sort of central Kruger area where I had that once before and they were there quite a feature for many many years but here we have got a bird that is not a migrant and it is another cooperative breeder that we've been talking about this is the arrow marked babblers that are having for themselves a little bath as well as you do on a warm day and you can see how they're always looking about they're a family unit so they do all their things together Sparrow hawks at their peril try and take out a bird in a group because they're always watching. So it's benefits to be out here with your friends and they assist in breeding and feeding. And they were doing some calling moments before which it's been stopped and then are jumping back into the thickets where it's safe. Generally birds come down and hang around water where there's a bush so they can flock back in there if any sign of danger approaches. It would be madness to try and outfly a small raptor-like bird. It would be like trying to outrun a jet fighter with a Cessna. It'd rather just um, rather just land or hide in the thick bush, and that's what the birds do. So maybe we're going to need some patience, and we're going to have to spend some time trying to see what we can find around the watering hole. where binoculars come in handy. Rose, the fastest bird in the world that we get in South Africa as well is called the peregrine falcon and that is only because it's got a, a, a swooping speed of, oh, it's enormous, I mean it's over, over 380 kilometers an hour I believe and the only reason they know that is because they took a, a sort of a semi-tame one up into a balloon or some form of, of contraption where they could go into the sky and they dropped a ball that had a speedometer on it that picked up a speed and obviously this bird caught it at a certain speed and then the speed would have stopped so that was the speed it caught it at and now it had to have caught that ball which means it was going faster than the speed of that ball to catch it if that makes sense I forget the exact number but it's a very very fast fastest creature on the planet well animal on the planet. I haven't seen a peregrine here but you do get them all over southern Africa. Very beautiful birds. I can get a picture out for you in a moment. I hope the glare is not going to be bad too bad this time. There we go, very sort of characteristic sort of falcon-like appearance. Let's hopefully get this screen in the right, let me do it this way, is that going to work better? Is that going to show me a bigger picture? Yes it will, look at that, how marvellous. Well that is the drawing, and if I just scan a little bit, there's the very falcon-like jet-like wings, which are characteristic of their family, and actually jet planes are designed after these birds. And uh, there you can see all over Southern Africa, there's patches where they don't occur. And uh, there is the beautiful bird. And they're very characterized by that sort of mask on the face, almost like a helmet coming down over the eyes. And these are a bird specialist. They hunt in the air. Um, I'm not saying that they wouldn't pick up any scavenge off the ground, but they're all about hitting birds in the sky and taking them down. And by the time they hit them, at that speed with those talons outstretched pretty much the bird is dead oh. so it's because of falcons it's could have but because of because of small raptors like that that all of these birds spend so much time together trying to prevent themselves from being eaten it's constantly predators out there 
Rosalind, hello. The biggest bird we get here, well, I haven't seen it, but there were tracks just the other day, just up from us here, and um, it was called in north of us in Buvasuk. It is the enormous ostrich. That is the largest bird in the world, I believe, and it occurs right here as well in the, the low felt, in the savannah biome. But their numbers are not great because uh, bush encroachment or in the densing of the bush due to lots of water around has led to lots of trees moving in and that leads to ostrich habitat disappearing and ostriches are prey to cheetah, leopard, lion I'm not sure about wild dog but they don't do very well in high predator density areas so they do quite well in more arid areas where the predator density is much lower you can just hear the shouting calls of the blacksmith lapwings always a common feature around watering holes Seb tries to catch one, having a little bit of a, of a show for us now. It's called the Flight of the Lapwings. <laughs> They're all putting on a show now. One's finally landed just here on the side, Seb. There we go. And it is sifting through some elephant dung. The water has attracted the elephant and the elephant have deposited their dung which provide not only vegetation nutrients but also um, insects that live inside that dung and quite a valuable food source for a lot of the birds that we find in the area that don't migrate away. Because we're in the heart of the dry season it must be understood that all the birds that we find here live here all year round. They don't migrate Birds migrate in, sometimes for breeding, but mainly just for feeding. And the feeding would be after the rains when they big, get big blooms of insects. So for example, all the cuckoos, they feed exclusively on, on caterpillars, which obviously bloom after some rainfall. So if you're looking for certain types of birds, time of year is very important. And that's why if you're looking for a bird in a bird book, when we talk about those starlings, the starlings are here all the time, but if you're looking for a bird and maybe you're confused between one or the other, well, think about what time of year it might be because it might not even be here. As James has laid down the challenge of the Wahlberg's eagle, you can confuse a Wahlberg's eagle with other smaller eagles, but they shouldn't be here quite yet, but soon, soon they will be here. But a month ago, it would be impossible. Possible. So those are little things that are important to take into consideration when identifying birds in a book Which can be quite helpful if you're a novice Okay, well, we're going to move on from here. Maybe do a loop around the watering I'll see if anything else materializes and while we do that Let's go with the Tristan and see what his plans are Well, I'm busy trying to scratch around for Wasana, Tandi and Klalamba because all their tracks are going in a similar direction. So I've just come along the Muwati from the elephants. We left them, they were in that thicket. So we might come back to them later if we have no luck with our leopards as they maybe ho hopefully go back towards the dam. But there's no sign of these leopards coming this way just yet. They, most of the tracks are pointing towards Philemon's dip. And so I wonder if Wasana is not tracking Tandi and Klalamba and, and Aubrey tells me that William's on foot and there's tracks for Tingana also around as well so I just want to try and see if any of them shifted to the east or if they all are on our western side at the moment if we can just kind of close off an area it's going to make life much easier and so what I'm doing is I'm just driving along and I'm checking all the places that I know that Tandi normally likes to use because I feel like she would be the key in this whole process is that if we can find her or at least find the direction she's moving maybe we can find the others in following her or just trying to kind of keep up with where she's walked but so far I don't pick up any sign of her coming on any of the game paths that I thought the problem is is the game path that I really thought she would take has been absolutely obliterated by a herd of impala there's just tracks all over that path and I actually found the herd of impala so had she walked here this morning it's going to be very very difficult but what we do know is that there wasn't any sign of them this morning, James said he checked thoroughly, so hopefully we will find them somewhere here. And while we look, I believe Steve has got an elephant that is approaching, well, one of the dams that he's at. Well, our patience pants have worked. If we'd left a minute before, we probably would have missed this. 
youngish sort of bull coming down. And um, just in front of him, you can actually see those tracks in the sand, those sort of lighter marks. That is where another elephant has walked, and he's kind of smelling the ground as well. Probably trying to find another comrade or two. Or maybe he's trying to find where the ladies have gone. Now, this is always fun to watch with elephants. Is they always take that top layer and they just sort of push it away. Is it? It's like a like what we do with coffee sometimes when the milk gets a bit sour. Well, not sour, but it gets a bit sort of gets that skin on top. You'll often find elephants sort of move their trunk around and sort of displace that little bit of organic material on top of the water before drinking, which he did, and then started drinking very quickly. You must be very thirsty. He looks a little bit stressed. <laughs> Mary goes swimming. Well, I hope he'll go swimming. Um, apparently, Tristan said yesterday that uh, it didn't look very deep, the water here. The buffalo were walking through the middle. I didn't see that. I did watch a bit of his buffalo segment, but I didn't see them actually doing that. So maybe he would get a bit wet, but maybe not completely submerged. And the reason I said he looks a bit stressed, not not that his, his behavior is stressed or anything like that, but if we look at his the side of his head, you can just see those glands there, that little line of moisture behind the eye. You start seeing that in elephants sort of this time of year, in the end of the dry season, especially in females. Um, it's a sign of stress. You see it in must bulls. That's a sign of stress. And in at females and males also, you can see it as a sign of food stress. When, when things are a little bit harder to come by, they're having to work a lot harder to get the same nutrients they would have during the, the wet season when there's lots of easy grass to be eaten. Um, you can see those things stream quite quickly in females that get stressed if the calf gets displaced or if they encounter lions that can stream almost immediately and it gives off all sorts of sort of chemical communication and, and pheromones. We don't know yet ourselves exactly what they give off but there must be a purpose behind it. Hey! <laughs> Old Wingston has just landed. <laughs> On, on the door next to me. I was busy peeling a piece of fruit and I think he decided he wanted my piece of fruit. Winston, this is my piece of fruit. He nearly he nearly squirreled it from me, from Zeb. Yeah. <laughs> so these are much more common around these yellow bull hornbills. Well, let's go back to our elephant. He is he's still busy doing his thing. Winston, I told you last time I'm not going to feed you. Rafael, ages of elephants take a bit of practice, but um, looking at the size of them is generally something we go with. And then also the, the tusk, especially in a male, generally as the males get older their tusks get a bit, bit bigger. But when an elephant looks at you and you see the front of his face, you get kind of this, if you draw a figure of eight from his tusks and then around his eyes, the wider the figure of eight is, generally the older and the older he is, and that comes with size as well. And after a bit of experience, you kind of, you can start guessing between maybe two and three years. You know, you can say, I mean, I could say this oak's probably between, sorry, I just said the word oak, I did that. This guy, this gentleman, is uh, probably between the ages of 28 and 32 maybe a little bit younger, probably about 26 to 20 to 28, somewhere around there. He's not a really big guy. He's still quite, he's still quite, quite young. He's not enormous. The, the bulls just get bigger and bigger. The entire body gets bigger, not just height, the entire body, the entire thing just bulks out in every direction, including the tusks. You can see he's going further and further in there, and they're still quite shallow. Kristen, how and why male elephants come into must? Well, I think the how is um, a pheromone chemical reaction that happens with inside of them. Um, it's a it's a response to breeding mechanisms inside of them. I'm not sure exactly how that works, um, but the bigger the male, 
the longer he can maintain a period of must and you generally get the really big dominant males maintaining periods of two to three months of must and the purpose of must is to heighten his aggression and his interest in females and all he does during that period of time is want to mate and um, his size with must gives him that added bonus and edge over other elephants um, but in saying that a younger elephant can come into must and can displace a bigger elephant that's not in must because it adds to his aggression state or to his sort of testosterone levels so that allows a young elephants or i'm not saying young elephants but younger elephants to mate with females to allow the gene pool to be sort of mixed around kind of like a wild card if you will but if a younger elephant comes into must and he encounters a bigger elephant he drops straight out of must and goes back into normal state so how exactly it happens it's a how exactly do, does anybody come into sort of breeding i suppose um i don't really know there's obviously some secretion given off in the brain some cue that happens with inside the the animals sort of what's that word oh, what's that gland i always forget this gland Mm, I think it starts pituitary gland I think is the right word if I'm not mistaken starts giving off all sorts of cues to the animal with regards to what's going on and um, the theremal the, the Jacobson organ in the top of the mouth elephants have one inside the roof of the mouth and I suppose if a if a bull elephant at the right sort of time of year smells a, a female in estrus it might just kick start his his movement and uh, most females in general want to sort of breed and drop their babies just before summer or as, as spring is sort of there so there's lots of sort of good vegetation lots of grass lots of nice juicy leaves because bearing in mind elephants gestation is 22 months so invariably you'll find most of your females come into estrus between the months of january February, March, April, maybe even May, so that almost two years later they'll be dropping their youngsters in sort of October, November, December time so that they can go through that whole summer period with lots of food, lots of vegetation to nourish them, uh, to look after the sort of the lactating parents or adults. And that's a period where you see most of the big dominant males come into sustained must during January through to about May. It's kind of the way the records work down here in the Kruger, that is. Other places it might be very different. I haven't looked too much into that. But uh, there's studies that friends of mine have done that show that certain elephants will come into must exactly the same time every single year for a very similar sort of period. And uh, a lot of that's got to do with the fact that they want to mate during that period. But there's other times of year where there's other females that come into estrus not during the peak periods. And that's when younger, less dominant males can have an opportunity to sow their seed, as it will. Paul, he's very thirsty. He's making me very thirsty as well. Um, lots of talking, watching an elephant drink is, it's like... Um, <laughs> I can't think of the analogy right now, but I think you all know what I mean. The, the <laughs> feels like my interview drive again, Seb, when I ran out of water. But I've got water. Excuse me while I have a little sip. It's good to, to keep the mouth nice and moisturized. And can you see he's gone in about three, four meters there? and he hasn't really gone much deeper. So there's a very good chance that that is the reason why Scuba Steve is not in um, attendance anymore. This watering hole is just too, too low for him. So it's probably why uh, we saw that hippo interacting at Chitra Dam. I saw two hippo interactions the other day. Maybe one of them was Scuba trying to vie for a place in the nicest watering hole nearby hard to say the only identification feature for scuba for me was that he was in this dam <laughs> Jen, an elephant can get about 10 liters or so into its trunk at once obviously depending on the size a young elephant versus a big elephant would be different but 10 liters what's that it's about a gallon or so of water into the trunk 
but obviously they also don't always suck up a full amount. Uh, he's being a bit playful sometimes. Uh, the first sip might be just to taste it. You know, sometimes we don't take the biggest sip out of our first drink. We're like, okay, what is this like? Bearing in mind, this is a watering hole that animals live in and defecate in. So it's not something you really want to gulp down, <laughs> but needs must. And uh, he's looking for the tastiest bits. And that's why he uses his trunk to stretch out like that and sucking up little bits at a time. I don't think he's filling his trunk every time. If he was, he'd be lifting his head right back and sort of shooting the water in. And now I think he's just enjoying it. What do you think, Seb? Mm -hmm. There we go. That was a better pull. Okay, well, we're going to stay here with this elephant. There's a good chance we might get another couple coming down. Who knows? Maybe a leopard will pop out of the, the woodwork like they did for Tristan yesterday. In the meantime, let's go and see if Tristan's had any luck that side. Well, not yet, but I've got Franklin's alarm calling quite heavily in the drainage. So I'm just trying to get towards where I heard them. They were calling from somewhere here. So I'm just trying to see. They're still calling ahead of me. So I wonder if this isn't where Hosanna is. I know he likes to use this drainage line quite a bit, so it would make sense if we found him here. I'm just scanning everywhere. He likes to walk more on the eastern bank, I mean the western bank. Oh, there he is, right here in front of us. There he is. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> Hello, boy. <laughs> Love it. It's so much fun finding this guy. Hosanna, you're a creature of habits, you know that. Hello, boy. So there we go. The Franklins did not lie to us at all. We managed to find him and look at him. Yes, so look, yes you are a very pretty boy. Well done, Hosanna. You've tricked me a little bit today because he hasn't walked quite where I thought he would. I was thinking he might be in the drainage itself and or on the western bank, but he's actually lying on the eastern bank. But the Franklins gave him away. We just heard some Franklins maybe making a little bit of noise. They were just kind of making a funny sound and then there was a burst of a cacophony of kind of two or three Franklins calling. And it could mean a lot of things. It could be a territorial fight. It could be obviously bird of prey. But given that his tracks were coming in this direction, I thought, well, we might as well come and investigate and it's worked out perfectly well so excellent excellent news so he's just sitting as regally as he ever does with his paws kind of out his eyes are fairly closed you've had a busy day today haven't you you've been stalking Nyala yes in our big yawn which is probably an indication that he's maybe going to stand up what are we going to do this afternoon Hasana? are we going to sleep or are we going hunting I haven't decided yet is basically what he's saying to me. His eyes are still heavy. Shame boy, have you had a long day today? Now, unfortunately, he tried to hunt and yell at the pan, but he, he missed. And the yawns indicate, though, that he does want to get going. And look at how bright and white and big those teeth are. They are as beautiful as they could be. And they'll only, from now, start getting worse and worse. They're not going to ever get as clean and as white as they are currently. But beautiful boy in this late afternoon light he's very pretty sorry Megs if you can just repeat the question I just broke up a little bit ah Zach who is a new viewer to Safari Live there's been quite a few new viewers of late and you say it's nice to meet Hosanna well Zach he is the best leopard to have around because he is full of entertainment and you will get to know him quite well over the course of the next few months hopefully next few years as he spends quite a lot of time in this area you can see he's spotted something now so he's very interested in something that is going on now I do need to call this in because we do have other people that are around but Zach he is the most charismatic cat that we get out here. I absolutely love spending time with him. Yeah, stations, I've just located Hosanna. He's off Philemon's dip um, on the drain in the drainage line, well, just on the eastern bank of the drainage line. Um, best access is to come from Philemon's dip on that two track north of the sausage tree and then head in a northwesterly direction. So you can see what he's actually watching at the moment. He's watching a diker that is straight ahead of him. So if you look where he is, David, you see there's a green tree just above him. 
then just straight through is where the dike is. So was it a steenbok? It's a steenbok that he's watching. So that's why he perked up so quickly. And he's probably now calculating, okay, where do I go in order to hunt this said steenbok? Now, of course, for us, we don't really want to move too much because steenbok are quite flighty animals and they don't actually like to move around too much they like to kind of be quite close and they you know they if as soon as they see movement then they just bolt and so for us we need to sit quite still and just wait and see what Hosanna does but how cool is it he's just watching ever so carefully his ears focused forward so he's kind of keeping a very close eye out on what's going on and I think there was another one that ran towards that one so there's actually two in this area so Pisces Bobby you say come on Hosanna show us your mighty hunting skills yes well he's certainly done a good job of late been lots and lots of carcasses that he's managed to, to bring down and so I'm hoping that this afternoon he'll show us just how good he can be the thing is though is that it's often when you follow leopard when they're hunting this is the kind of scenario that you want you want it to be a little bit more open because we can sit right here and hopefully watch him worm his way closer and actually not get too close because sometimes with us driving behind them and hitting trees and stuff we obviously are not helping much in their hunting and remember a leopard is a stealth animal that likes to ambush and so it would be better if this leopard could just sneak its way forward and get there so hopefully he'll show us just how good he is at doing it it's not his preferred tactic of late his preferred tactic of late has been to sit in wait near water where animals will come down and drink as you maybe know and then as they come down he then runs out and grabs them and pulls them down so it'll be interesting just to see kind of how this plays out and whether or not we actually see him going for a proper stalk it is quite open so he's gonna to have to do a lot of work to get where he needs to be in order to actually hunt that particular animal in front of him I'm also intrigued as to what his route is going to be from here is he going to head back to the dam or is he going to stay in these areas and hunt in the thickets it's almost like he's trying to try something new over the last week and um, I think probably because he's had so many kills stolen at the pan itself Maybe he's decided that if he hunts a little bit further away from that water point, there's a better chance of him actually keeping the kill than if he hunts very, very close. But it is good news that he's awake and looking. It definitely means that he's hungry and wants to try and find food. And we know Hosanna has a bottomless pit of a tummy. And he likes to try and get as much food in as possible. And he ate yesterday. He stole Tandy's kill yesterday morning. And so it's not like he's empty, but still that mind is ticking and he can't help himself anything that moves I suppose gets leopards going hello beautiful boy so he's now looking around he's decided no Steenbok is too fast for him maybe Dyke is better that's what he might be looking for or Impalas those are the two that he seems to have gone after quite a bit of late So Mr. Public, it's going to be a gradual process. His dewlap will, will gradually get bigger and bigger. It's also a genetic thing. Sometimes you'll find leopards won't have as big a dewlap as others. Um, but it's already starting to grow. So you, if you look, what are you watching, Hosanna? Oh, he's just smelling the breeze. So he's got his nose up to the breeze. The good thing for us is if we want, we want him to go back towards the dam cam, the wind is actually coming from where the dam cam is in relation to him. And so he might walk into it towards the dam cam itself. But, or he might come straight to us. Oh, look at that big stretch so back to his dewlap it'll probably be fully developed by the time he reaches about eight nine years of age that's normally when they develop but you can see he's going to walk right past us I don't know what it is about this afternoon that we're getting all the animals walking right where we want them and right at our vehicle now Hosanna where are you off to boy I wonder if he's going to do what he did the other day, which is basically use this drainage line as a hunting place where he can go in through the thickets and he can disturb things like dikers and, and scrub hares and try and hunt those. So uh, I'm interested to see if he's going to use a similar technique where he kind of just dives into th bushes and try and push his scrub hares out, or is he going to go around and just kind of walk and try and get to a water point again where he'll be able to hunt. But look at this. Hello, boy. Are you saying hello to David now? Yes. That is just so cool. I can promise you that it never, ever, 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 ever gets old. It is the best thing to have them walking past like that. It absolutely gets me going every single time. Right, well, we're going to follow him. We're going to see where he goes, see what he gets up to. Undoubtedly, it'll be an entertaining afternoon. And while we do that, we'll send you back across to Steve. And hopefully a leopard does pop out wherever he is, just like it did yesterday for us. 
Well, two more elephants, Trist, have joined the foray. You can see one in the reflection of the dam and another little younger one there. It's a much smaller individual here and there's a bit of dominance display going on. There's a young male that seems to have joined this other male and there's a third male that joined who we'll see in a moment. He hasn't even come down yet. He's kind of walked around the back and has been showing really, really sort of submissive behavior to this first elephant bull that came down. But uh, that's what happens is you get displays between elephants and they're very subtle. It's all about body posturing. Can you see how this elephant on the left is just turning his shoulder? He's kind of inviting him down now, but now he's turned around. So that's what elephants will do. If one elephant walks up to another one and to show submissive behavior, you turn your back on that individual and you show your shoulder. And that is basically standing down, obviously, because elephants, when they're not standing down, when they're showing sort of dominance, they make themselves as big as possible. And that comes from the front. So as soon as you turn your back, you're showing yourself to be smaller and s submissive. And obviously, the little youngster that was at the bottom doesn't need to do that. He's probably outcast from his herd for some reason and is following these two gentle giants around. And let's watch what happens here. See the one at the bottom is busy showing himself now see how he's showing himself from the front something going on between these two that we don't understand there's probably an entire conversation going on between them that little brother at the back is basically just a party to but he's not very interested in because he's happy to drink but the elephant at the top he wants to come can you see that Oh, I see this, he's unsure. Do you see how he was holding his foot in the air like that? Oh. Bob, no, elephants enjoy clean water. They will obviously drink uh, muddy water or the, the dirtier water if need be, if it is all that is available. Look who's coming from the side. <laughs> Sorry, Bob. I'm sorry, Bob. I, I, I lose my words when I see these little things. Now, this one is probably going to charge down the hill. Mum is relaxed. Little baby's going to charge down the hill because it's all about momentum when you're an elephant. All about momentum. There he goes. No, no, no. He's probably going to fall straight in the water. <laughs> okay, so that makes more sense. That is mum coming, and that's probably mum's bigger offspring that's closest to the water, the youngest one. And that's her, her baby. And she's probably associated with these other two um, young males. See how she just wastes the water a little bit. Just takes off that little top layer. The youngster has no idea what it's doing. <laughs> Here we go. Let's see the body posturing. See, he's not trying to come directly at him. He does look bigger though, the one on the left. They're going to touch mouths together, are they? Here we go, you see how he's putting his trunk into his mouth. He's going, look where I've been. Look what I've been doing. That's the Jacobson organ inside, the top of the mouth. And by taking your trunk and blowing your, your, your air in there and sniffing the other one, you can pick up all sorts of things. Like, oh, you were at the nightclub and you were wearing that perfume and you smoked some cigars and you drank that single malt. And there's all sorts of things that get communicated through just a little whiff of air blown into the roof of the mouth. And so maybe these two know each other. Maybe they haven't seen each other in some time. Maybe they were just trying to figure it out. A very equivalent size. Now there's going to be a little bit of a tug of war. And being very gentle. Very gentle. Here we go. That's where they'll push. When they fight, when they fight aggressively, they push on the noses and the, tr the tusks can actually inflict quite a lot of damage with all the power behind. There you'll see a little bit of play happening. It's not serious stuff yet. You can see they're equivalent in size. I don't know if you can hear it, but you can hear the sort of the clanging of ivory. It always jars me when I hear that. Imagine your teeth. Imagine your teeth hitting against something. Never a very nice feeling. Here 
Here we have definitely the family. And mom showing the other two exactly how it's done. Rosalind, yes, elephants do have teeth. They've got a whole lot of molars inside of their mouth. Now uh, they actually get six pairs or six sets of molars throughout their life. Can you see how he's just turned sideways like that? It's showing a little bit of submissive behavior. You can see it, it almost like slumps his shoulders slightly. But it's just play. Um, the, the tusks are actually modified in sizes coming out of the mouth. And then inside of their mouth they've got very flat <laughs> Uh, with uh, molars that are ridged at first but wear down and they they grow from the back and they eventually push out at the front and after the sixth set of molar has kind of been forced out of the mouth from the back that is when the animals get very old and uh, that's when they start losing condition because they can't really feed but anyway the little chief seems to be on the move let's go catch up with him he is indeed but it is seriously beautiful he's walking along a bank with the sun behind him at the moment and we have really kind of enjoyed his company so it is absolutely beautiful to see look at that he's right up on the bank next to us and i thought maybe we might lose him because we were going to be a little far away but you know after he crossed but he just kind of came right back to us and is now just sitting on this bank itself it is seriously beautiful now david i'm going to try and do something quickly let's just see if i can get through oh no i thought he might do that i was going to see if, if we didn't start maybe he was going to stay up there what are you looking at boy there's nothing down here i can promise you he's a funny cat this he's gonna jump oh, did he... how cool was that <laughs> I love when leopards jump around. That's amazing. Now look at him. He's, it's almost like he's playing. What are you doing, boy? I don't see anything that he could be stalking. I think he's more playing than anything else. There's a vehicle that's there that I can see, but there's definitely not an animal, unless I've somehow missed something. This is so, so cool. What are you doing, Hosanna? So, Monique, the uh, predators, uh, they are not so much in taste, but as in technique. So certain predators will refine their technique on certain animals. So if we look at things like the Inkahuma pride, they're very good at hunting buffalo. And they will rather go after buffalo than anything else, but due to circumstance, they've had to try and adapt their diets and hunt things like impalas and kudu and all the various other antelopes. If there was buffalo here more often, you'd find Inkahumas would almost specialize in that. If we look at Hosanna, for instance, he seems to completely ignore Steenbok and really goes after Daika more than anything else. And then every now and then will go after impalas too. But for the most part, he tries more than to go for for diker and scrub hairs more than anything else that seems to be his preferred meals when he was very young he tried to go after terrapins and monitor lizards more than he used to go after you know anything else in that period so it just depends on what he can try and kind of find and and but he generally is targeting certain species because he'll have refined his technique and knows that he's able to kind of get certain things so it's quite an interesting way and, and and study on predators i'm pretty sure that they all kind of have their preferences and i don't think it's taste i think it's more availability and ease of of hunting we know that you know cheetah and the mara tommy is really what they go after every now and then they'll pull down other things but thompson's gazelle is what they like the most and then if you look at the lions like the sausage tree pride they want to hunt wildebeest more than anything else but when there's no wildebeest around well what's the next best thing it's buffalo and so they go after buffalo and they're forced to learn how to hunt buffalo in order to survive during the migration period when the migration is not around okay well he's gone away from us a little bit which means we're gonna have to try and figure out how to get up that bank which is going to be interesting so while i do try and figure that out let's send you back across to steve who's got ellie's drinking at bubble zook dam Yes, well, the little one is learning from the bigger one. The bigger one was showing it. This is how you splash, like that. Have a look. Splash, splash, splash. And then I think you pick it up with your... There we go. Just like that. And pour it on your face. That's how it's done. Well, Mum's a much better teacher. Now, <laughs> it's got a very 
and mum just had a bit of a toilet break. So we can actually look at this female and, and try and age her. If you look at how, how wide her eyes are, and then go down a little bit, you can see the tusks are actually quite wide. But female elephants, uh, the older they get, the tusks will never, that sort of ridge where the tusks come out, will never be wider than the eyes. Whereas maybe her late 30s, 40s, I would guess. But Well, sorry about that, folks. I'm not sure what gremlins are playing out about us. But uh, I think I was discussing age. And, it'd be, you know, that's, that's kind of just like a guesswork in the field. But to get a really good accuracy of age, you can take tail, tail hair and you can measure it under a microscope. It goes in seasons, uh, each growth year, each growth season. Um, but if you also get a, a mold of their teeth, which is not the easiest thing in the world to do, Oh, she's not happy with something. What happened, Mama? That's a, an annoyance, a head shake. Not for us, I don't think. But have a look at that pile of dung there, Seb. Just by her feet. The flies are already there. Already look at that, eh? She only dropped that a minute ago, and already there are insects there that will then lay their eggs and breed. So the, providing the food we were talking about earlier. Alex, age nine, you want to know when elephants start to grow their tusks? Well, from about a year, you start getting this little milk tusk that comes through, this just little protrusion on the face, and then slowly, slowly, slowly... Oh, <laughs> sorry, I'm just looking at how it, how it is trying to pick up the water. Uh, elephants of that age aren't able to really use their trunks to suck up the water. Um, so that's why they drink with their mouth. And this one's probably going to be forced in a minute to stick its face right into the water to drink. Because it takes a good year, two years, to really get any moisture in there. To figure out how to use those 100,000 or odd muscles in the trunk that suction up all the water. And then to be able to lift the trunk and put it in the right spot like that. Look at that technique. That is a perfect technique. Well practiced. The youngster you could see was a little bit flimsy <laughs> in the uptake. But when thirsty enough, we'll, um, we'll definitely drop its face down in there. Okay, well we're going to move on from our elephants and go back towards the lions in the next little while. And let's go over to Hosanna, the chief in the golden light. Well, he is in the golden light. There you go. You can see he's just sitting. Now, I think there is another leopard here. Now, I'll tell you why. Because he's been walking around. He stopped. He listened. And the birds have just gone absolutely crazy on my left-hand side. And they were go-away birds, Franklins. And that normally only happens when there's another, when there's a predator around, much like how we found Hosanna. And so it's not for him. He's too far up. They weren't going crazy when he was mobile and he was just sitting still. And so it can't be for that. I think they've spotted another leopard somewhere here. There's tracks for Tandi, Kalamba, Tingana, all in this area. And who knows? You can actually still hear the go-away birds. They're calling on our left towards Philemon's dip area. So I wonder if maybe, just maybe, there isn't another leopard. Now the little snarl that he let off just now was not because the other leopard might be here or other predator might be here that's more a case of him i think seeing a little franklin close by and just snarling at the franklin often you'll find leopards when a franklin walks close by to them they actually snarl at them it's quite funny to watch but they kind of give them these teeth and bare their teeth at that end that little bird that kind of is there now i'm trying to figure out where i want to go from here because i thought he might come down the path he's slightly veered off a little bit and kind of gone into this little thicket i can just see him coming through now David, can you see him on top there? He's just in that little area right there. Might be a bit obscured for David at the moment. Go a little bit to the left, Dave. Let's just see. No, I think you were right. My apologies, you were right. Somewhere through there. Chris, no, I don't think we're going to see a fight. I think that 
in all likelihood, you know, even if there's no, if there's no meat involved, I don't think we'll have too much of a worry as to what's going on. But he's definitely walking a lot more gingerly and a lot more carefully and stopping and listening. And those birds are still going insane down to my south kind of east at the moment so I don't think it'll be a fight I mean I, you know we've seen them with Tandy and with Tingana a few times and he hasn't fought with them that much yesterday was a bit of a, a blowout over food but it wasn't anything too serious it was more just a kind of spat over a little bit of food and it was all sorted out quite quickly but something has definitely disturbed those birds heavily the only other thing that could potentially have caused those birds to be as upset as what they were was maybe an owl that's the only other thing that causes grey go away birds and franklins to call like that or maybe a predatory bird of prey like a, a african harrier hawk they also cause the birds to go a bit moggy because they hunt birds so those are the only options that i can potentially foresee now he's moving again away from us so i'm going to just try and reposition i'm trying to stay down here because i'm backing the fact that he's going to come back down at some point and that we're going to see him kind of moving back towards us I know it's a long shot, but we're going to back it and hope that it works. Let's see. I'm going to just try and get across this particular section. Shouldn't be too difficult. I've crossed here before, I think. Maybe. That stump moved the way that it is. It has my name all over it, I think. I was following Hukumuri once through here, and I'm pretty sure I drove over that stump at one point. Now, he theoretically, I was thinking, should come down here somewhere now it looks like he actually has crossed the road has he crossed the road yes he has crossed the road okay so he's not going to come this down the side if he hadn't crossed the road then i would have expected him to come down either through here this is where he walked the other day when i followed him is straight down this particular pathway but if he's gone the other way then we're gonna have a tough time trying to follow him down here if he's on top so let's just try to get up Right, now, while I kind of catch up with him, he's just in front of me over here. Let's send you back across to Steve, who's still with the Ellies. Yes, well, these two young elephant bulls have been behaving quite strangely. Well, not strangely, really, but just like young elephant bulls will do. They'll be play fighting and pushing each other. And now the one went half submerged in the water there. You can see just ankle deep. And the other one went and seemed to go and sulk up against the bank and just pushed his head against the bank. I was like, oh, you don't want to play with me anymore. And now as soon as he came out, he looks all happy again. There's so many human attributes and behaviors that we can sort of link and see when we look at elephants is why we can connect with them so much. They mourn, they sulk, they grieve, they get angry, they get excited. They portray so many things that we can relate to with ourselves. And they also play just for the point of playing. You see cats playing, and uh, cats playing because that's for survival. That's how they're going to learn how to feed and catch their food. Poofy Poof, what a marvelous name. <laughs> um, do elephants give off a particular scent? There's, there's like a sweet, musty smell that elephants have. If you ever get close enough to smell one, it's very hard to really explain it to you. Uh, each one's slightly different, but their, their dung can be quite pungent when it's fresh, and their urine as well, due to a lot of the sort of tannin in the in the diet. But it's very hard to explain. It's a bit of a, a bit of a sour, musty sort of sour with a sweetness to it. It's a, really hard for me to wrap my head around I'm listing all the categories of smell right now so sorry for my lack of description but these two are quite evenly matched and after having a little bit more of a look at their size and their sort of their face I'm going to put them closer to 20 23 years old not as high up as 26 to 28 because the tusks are still quite narrow along the side of the face. But it's, it's, it's quite hard for me to explain it all to you. It's just practice, I suppose. And there are keys out there that you can use. There was a researcher I looked at some things. She had some keys that made it very easy to identify. So I'm going to see if I can scratch up on those and see exactly if I can show you people where I get this information. But anyway, while these elephants push each other Back towards the watering hole, Tristan is caught up with the sign and let's go see what he's doing. 
Well, we have caught up with him. He's slinking through the bushes as though he's spotted something. Look at how he's going low down to the ground, which is pretty typical of a leopard when it's kind of spot something. Now, we figured out why the birds were going crazy. It's not another leopard. It's actually, And that's why he's actually here. I'm pretty sure he's walked straight to where these birds were going mad. And what we saw take off from the ground was an African hawk eagle juvenile. So a little young African hawk eagle. I wonder if it maybe killed something and has now flown off because the way he's looking is though he's spotted something on the ground. Now, Hosanna, where are you going? Might happen, you know, often African hawk eagles will kill something like a Franklin or a bird and then if they're disturbed they just leave it and fly off if it's too heavy for them. So it could have been that, but it was definitely a juvenile African hawk eagle that was that took off and they will definitely cause a lot of birds to shout. They are big bird hunters. Oh, the vehicles are really not helping us today at all. They keep parking right behind Hosanna which is not ideal so hopefully they'll settle there we go they've settled out of the picture which is quite nice of Aubrey thank you very much Aubrey and there he goes Hosanna just kind of still slinking so interesting to watch him he kind of doesn't at the moment he's not using roads at all we're walking parallel with the road at the moment and then he kind of just ducks off and, and sits here and he's almost following the road course but not quite right david let's just reposition because where we are is not a very good view at all so i'm going to try and see if i can just get into a better spot somewhere over here should be able to slide in into this little kind of area which should be perfect for David. David, are we good there? That looks very good. I agree. The thing is, is if he moves it's not going to be as good but hopefully he'll look over our kind of way. He's not going to look that much this direction because most of his movements is this afternoon has been going kind of southward so it would make more sense if he kind of sat there and looked that direction but every now and then he might look in our kind of way which would be quite nice but he's come to exactly where this bird took off so i think he was investigating much like what we were saying is that there's definitely a disturbance here that he needs to check out i wonder if leopards are able to work out what the disturbance is and whether or not the disturbance is something that they should be concerned about so do you think i wonder if they know that the way that a go away bird calls is different for a leopard if it is for a lion if it is for a a bird of, of prey and they're able to calculate that because certainly for us it's very difficult you know a go away bird is a go away bird in terms of its alarm call and so is a franklin i've struggled to even pick up any differences i know monkeys have a huge array of um changes in their their tones and and their way that they shout when they alarm call for all the different predators and some of the trackers the very best trackers are able to pick it up they know the difference between a crowned eagle versus a leopard versus a lion which is pretty insane now the other interesting thing that we've got is we've got there we go so how there we go so there is another leopard not far from here tingana is at Treehouse Dam. So directly from where we are is Treehouse Dam, just over the ridge here. So there is another leopard, so if Steve's around, maybe he can go and head off in that direction. But that's interesting because I didn't, I had a feeling there was other leopards around. It looks like there is another leopard there, so quite interesting. The other thing that I was going to say is that it's not every day that we get a leopard like this. And then in the tree above me, David, if you can see over there, there is another type of leopard because there is a leopard orchid so not very often that we get the two together in the same sighting so the leopard orchid is looking very healthy that particular orchid and it's got a prime spot it's on this kind of perfect platform and you can actually see that there is a flower that's starting to develop now hopefully it will open fairly soon on it it's just on the left side there we go and you see it's a yellow flower with little black spots on it so that's where it gets its name from as leopard orchid and, and i think it's actually maybe an old flower that's already died out but very cool to see so not always not always the, the kind of two. Now you got a bit of a fright because a branch has moved. Anyway, then we're going to sit here. We'll enjoy his company. I wonder if he's going to take us to that other leopard. In the meantime, let's send you back across to Steve and the playful Ellies. Yes, well, this one's trying to get the upper hand. The one on the right is the one who's been losing this whole time. And now he's managed to turn the other one around. And he's backing him in a corner by using a bit of height. You see how height makes a huge difference. He looks so much bigger. Oh, hang on. How big are you? He doesn't quite have the technique at that position. Come on, push him, young elephant. Push him. Push him into the water. 
<laughs> it feels like my brother and myself playing years ago. Ah, do you hear that? Clashing of tusks. Here we go. He's turned his shoulder. That's a hundred percent submissive behavior there. Sorry, Megs, what was that? He's busy smelling his penis sheath. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to, the info that I mentioned earlier, I don't have it with me. I'm going to have to check it. I've got some files at home. And when I say home, I mean in Johannesburg. So I'll get back to everybody on that information, on getting some nice, accurate information on how to identify the age of elephants. I might even be able to Google at some stage. But where I'm sitting right now, we are in a very low signal stage. But anyway, these elephants are now playing nicely again. We're going to move off seeing as they're done with their shenanigans and uh, we now have a selection of opportunities for us a little bit further south at two other watering holes because that's where the action is always in and around the watering holes it's why it's so important to check these areas quite regularly we're going to move off and uh, let's see what do we want to do do we want to go see in Tingana who I think has just been found or do we want to go and see those very sleepy Uncle Huma Lions. Well, Seb and I are going to make that decision in a moment on our way out. And who knows, we might turn out of here and find Tandi and the lovable Tlalamba just materializing as they do out of nowhere. But anyway, Tristan is already with a leopard. So while we wave goodbye to these beautiful elephants, bye elephants, thanks for the wonderful afternoon. Let's go back over to Tristan and Hosanna. Well, we are still sitting with Hosanna, and look at that. Is that not just spectacular? Absolutely beautiful. He really is developing into an incredibly good-looking specimen. You can see his head's getting bigger, his shoulders are bigger. He's starting to look very much like a stocky male leopard should. So very, very cool. And hopefully Steve will get, get some sort of leopard for him given that he's been trying to look and it's amazing that Tingana is around I think Tingana is on a kill personally that's my belief because he came for water yesterday he was round as a, any sausage leopard could ever be and he is the original sausage so there's sausage version 1 which is Tingana and sausage version 2 which is Hosanna but sausage version 1 was a sausage last night at the pan his tummy was huge and round and he's then gone down this direction. Aubrey told me that he went to Treehouse Dam, there was no sign of a leopard there, and he kind of saw tracks going away from the water into the block coming back towards where we are now. Now there's somebody else who's gone past Treehouse Dam and found a leopard on the dam wall there, which is uh, it sounds like Tingana. I mean, I'm assuming it is. It could obviously be a different male leopard, but I'm assuming it's Tingana. And I wonder if that individual doesn't have a, a kill because normally when a leopard goes away from water and then back again, there is a reason for that. It's normally because they have food fairly nearby. And given the size of his tummy, it's very possible. I'm not sure which way Tingana came from last night. Did anyone see which way Tingana came towards the dam cam last night? If he came from the south, then it could very well mean that he's got a kill somewhere in this general block area off Philemon's, um, between Philemon's and Treehouse, maybe Philemon's in the dam, and he's just deciding which one he wants to actually drink out of. It wouldn't surprise me. If he does have a kill, though, it will be all but done. There won't be very much left of it because of the size of his tummy yesterday, and given that he would have then spent the whole day eating, I don't think there would be too much left, but it will be interesting. There's going to be a yawn from Hosanna fairly shortly, I think, and when we see him yawn one more time, then I think that's going to be him getting up and starting to move once again, and I'm intrigued to see how far Hassan is going to go because we haven't seen him go anywhere near Treehouse Dam since he arrived back, well as far as we know, of course you never know with these things, but I haven't seen any tracks for him going that way and it's going to be an interesting kind of process to see whether he actually goes down that area again. He used to love Treehouse Dam. This time last year, Treehouse Dam was his firm favourite. He used to bounce between Treehouse, where you'd go Twin, I mean Treehouse Dam, Twin Dams, Treehouse Dam on Little Gauri and then Chitwa Dam and then kind of repeat that process. That was Hosanna's little circuit that he used to run. Whereas now, he's kind of foregone Twin Dams and Treehouse Dam and he's now spending more time at the pan itself. Not that, that we have any reason to complain about that. He's given us more than we could ever expect on his arrival. To think that 
less than a, well, about a month ago, they, everyone was kind of crying for Hosanna to come back, and we were all, including us, we were all desperate for him to come back, and that we didn't, you know, even one sighting would have been nice. And to think since then we have been spoiled with a sighting of Hosanna every single day pretty much since that period and sometimes even for 24 hours of the day while he sat at the at the camp so look oh big yawn no i think he's going to stand up fairly shortly health six if he came across one of the lions he's going to be in trouble because a lion will undoubtedly chase him um, if he sees them first, then he'll try and get away and try and scramble out of there. Definitely won't engage with a lion at all. In fact, there was a leopard that was killed this morning in the Starby Sands, not here in the northern area, so it's not a leopard that we know, but there's a leopard that was killed down in the south of the Sabi Sands on Sabi Sabi, and the guys are saying that it's a female leopard, but they don't, they don't know for sure because there wasn't much left. But there we go. Like I said, he'll, once he yawns, he'll start to move again. So they don't know if it was a male or a female, but it sounds like... A female leopard that unfortunately met its end to lions. So the leopards do not want to run into lions at all. They want to try to stay away from lions as much as possible over the course of their life. Good. Now I'm going to try and move because I'm going to have to go all the way around and get out of where we are. He looks like he's going slowly but surely towards Treehouse Dam. Are we going to get a father-son reunion this afternoon? Maybe. Sounds like it might do. Hosanna just loves to have company by the looks of things. He just kind of goes wherever he can find everybody else. David, are we good there to reverse? We've got a big stump there. Let's not hit that because that will be traumatic for our right back side of the car. And Wendy's already sporting a nice little dent on its back left. All right, let's go around. Here we go. We are winning. We are winning. Excellent. Good, so I'm hoping that he's going to head to where I think he's going to head. But it should be absolutely beautiful if he does go onto the road. No, yeah, yes, Tumba's still around. Not so much on Juma. He doesn't get seen here really anymore, which makes me very, very sad. Because he is my favorite. Even though Hosanna is amazing, and I've spent lots of time with Hosanna lately, and it's hard, it's very hard not to have Hosanna as a favorite. It's, it's a constant struggle in my head to keep Tumba at a number one position but you know it really in my kind of book Tumba is just the most beautiful leopard but he is around he gets seen um, along kind of the Ottawa area and Elephant Plains he was seen yesterday morning his kill unfortunately was stolen by another male naughty other male and he lost it so I suppose that's one thing that Hosanna and Tamba have got in common is that everyone keeps pilfering their hard-earned meals and what's amazing with the two of them is they've both really done well when it comes to hunting both of them have managed to find the food items that they need to survive on a day-to-day -day basis given that both were well, in Tumba's case, kicked out at a young age, and Hosanna's case, orphaned at a young age. It really is amazing that they've both managed to kind of get to where they have. And I'm trying to see where Hosanna is. I suspect he's somewhere around there. He is. I can see him through there. Um, it's going to be difficult for you, David. I'll go forward a bit there. Can you see him, David? Where the car is, I'm afraid. So straight through there into that green thicket. And can you see him just on the back there? Where that car is reversing there he is he's just watching the people reversing in the background so you can see how well they camouflage in these thickets you'd think a leopard would stand out but it does not at all it is very difficult to see and how you can see why spots work in a area where there is a lot of trees and dappled light it just breaks up that outline completely and it becomes seriously difficult to see I mean that's very 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 punched in view of Hosanna when you come out a little bit it really is difficult there you go now spot the leopard. Almost impossible to see him in that kind of terrain. So we'll just wait and see where he's going to go from here. I suspect that he's going to come along. There's a nice big termite mound that's not far from where we are now and I'm really hoping that he goes and sits on that termite mound because if he does, that termite mound, the sun will be directly behind him and we might get that silhouette shot that we've been trying to get with him yesterday and we got a bit thwarted by a buffalo thorn not that I'm complaining because we had a seriously seriously epic sighting of this guy yesterday afternoon at Biffles Oak Dam Wall and I was thoroughly chuffed with that so you know it's it's it will be nice if he does go onto the mound and we get that sunset shot now please excuse me because I need to sneeze 
mm, it's gone. All good. So Catherine, no, I don't know if it's that he wants company due to his mom and sister leaving him so early. I mean, he actually was the one that left Shungile more than Shungile left him. He became quite sort of independent in that regard and decided that he wanted to go and see all the other family members and visit everybody. Um, so I think it's not so much that he's lonely. I think it's more that he's curious. He's a young cat. He, he wants to investigate. He wants to see what's going on. He wants to know what's happening in his area. And so he hears alarm calls and things, and he likes to go and investigate to see what's going on with all of his siblings and his kind of dad and check what's happening. And then on top of that, you know, because he's a young cat, when he does come across them, he has to be quite submissive. And so he can't be a threat and can't be aggressive and can't go after them. And that means that he generally is a very kind of relaxed leopard around other leopards. And there's something about him, though, that the other leopards... While they get a bit grumpy with him from time to time, they're fairly tolerant. I mean, I've never really had the situation that I've had with him. And, and Tumba, to a degree, was the same. I mean, we saw Tumba in the same area as Hukumuri once before and didn't get chased. We saw him the next morning in the same place and somehow managed to avoid Hukumuri. And we even saw him with Tingana around as well and even Hosanna. So, you know, it's an interesting kind of take on it. Uh, these two boys have just decided that they don't want to be enemies of everybody and that they're going to take the time to befriend every other leopard that occurs here. Now he is walking straight to the termite mound that I was hoping. No, oh, don't turn there now, Hosanna. He was supposed to turn a little bit more to his left. David, let's catch up with him because he's going to go into a very deep area. So I want to just keep up with him. And I know this is a tough place to go because I followed the Inkahuma pride through here once, which was not so pleasant. Right, now there is the sunset, there is a leopard, and they are kind of going hand in hand. There's sunset there, and leopard down there, which is all quite nice. Good. While we admire both of those, let's send you back across to Steve, who apparently has got his foot rather flat on his accelerator. No, I don't, Tristan. I'm no driving fast at all. Seb, have we been driving fast? We have been taking it very casual. I've just been mimicking the slinking Hosanna as we slink it back towards the Muhammad pride because the one is there with the Tingana. just moved. But we've got to go check them out because they're so close to our southern boundary and we don't get to see lions that often. Tristan's got a leopard. Tingana will be around. Let's go see what the lions are up to. Maybe they're going to... That Daker is always under that tree. I wonder if he knows. Oh, there he goes. You, you didn't see him. I'm sorry, folks. But he's busy munching the leftover berries fallen on the tree, on the floor of the um, jackalberry. And we're going to sneak up to these lions now. They're not far away. Keeping our eyes peeled. They're always, they may have moved. You don't just want to drive past the pride of lions. I already called an Egyptian goose. A uh, fish eagle today. Kelsix, you want to know how many people live permanently in the park? Wow, I honestly don't know. Tristan has worked in the Sabi Sands a lot longer than I have. He knows sort of more and more about the lodges and how many people work at them. He might be better suited to answer that. I'd say just where we work, if you exclude Wild Earth and you just look at sort of Juma Lodge itself, I'd say there's probably 20 to 30 people there plus our 20 plus that's just Juma and then all of the other reserves in this area well yeah so just on Juma probably 50 odd people give or take give or take a few okay now why are the lions not there the truck that is broken down is now right here which is probably the problem the truck that broke has been pushed. The lions were right here under this tree. I have no doubt that if there were people pushing it or some form of tractor, it would have caused these animals to move off. Uh, here we go. There's one over here. Okay, so they moved off not very far, but the good news, folks, is they've moved closer into Juma than where they were previously. There's the young male. Okay, well, <laughs> they're not doing much, are they, Zeb? No. 
We'll get in here though. The whole tide is here. Have a look for a little bit and see what's happening. So you want this lion with the with the light there. Okay. Okay, well while we try and get in a good position with these cats and uh, the injured female, let's go back over to the little chief. Well, he's done exactly what I had hoped for. He's gone up the mound where I wanted him to go and there is this big ball of orange sun directly behind him. Now he just needs to take two steps to his left and we are going to be perfect. There we go. Thank you, Hosanna, right there. Exactly. Thank you very much. That's exactly what I wanted. Is that not spectacular? Well done, Hosanna. You are seriously looking good on your mound. He is bathed in the most golden, golden light. His whole coat has got this kind of little golden rim on it at the moment, which is absolutely spectacular. It doesn't really get much better than that. I can assure you that right now. Wow. Very, 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 very cool. Now, I'm pretty sure that he's going to not be up there forever. I mean, he's obviously going to just look around for a bit and kind of check it out. And then we'll find that he'll probably, in all likelihood, come down. And he is facing towards Trias Dam. So while he's not at Trias Dam yet, he is facing into that area. So I wouldn't be surprised if he does go towards Treehouse and actually ends up pretty much close to where Tingana is. It will be very cool if he does because, well, oof, look at that. That is amazing. Thank you, Hosanna. That is exactly what I was asking for. MK, indeed, it would make a great painting, wouldn't it? You've got the red, red, red African sun setting. Leopard on a mound. His whole coat is glowing on the fringes. It really is a quite surreal kind of setting and like I say I've been waiting for him to do it and I was hoping I saw this mound from the other side of the drainage already and he kind of was looking in this direction and with the angle of the Sun I knew he'd be quite close I didn't think it would line up quite as well as it has right now but the only thing that I would be better would be the lack of grass if he had a nice bear termite mound that would make it that much better but I mean beggars can't be choosers and this really is as good as get Mr. Nam, he is really great at posing, isn't he? He's seriously, seriously beautiful. He's got it down pat. He's got every model pose that you can ask for. He's got the over the shoulder. He's got the regal on the mound pose. He's got the, you know, sleepy pose, the dopey pose, the, the cute factor as well. So he's really, he's gone to model school and done it very well. His mom obviously showed him a few things because, well, she also was not too bad at being able to to pose herself so very cool now I'm hoping that that Sun will just soften a little bit and we'll be able to see how red it actually goes it's a really incredible kind of view and one day we'll hopefully get cameras that will be able to match our eyes because as much as the best cameras in the world are good they still can't quite get the same kind of color rendition that we get out of a scene but is that not spectacular I think it's absolutely spectacular. I think we are very, very, very fortunate to see what we are seeing right now. It's like I say, we couldn't have asked Osana to do it any better than he actually did. He um, was, you know, he kind of walked up and I thought maybe, just maybe he might lie off to the side, but he has lay really exactly where I wanted him to lie, which is perfectly with that sun kind of setting behind him. Thank you, Osana. You've made my day in many respects not only finding him but also just kind of watching him with the sun going down on the afternoon there really isn't many kind of better places or any other places i would really want to be at this stage i am thoroughly happy to have him sitting where he is right now very very special I wonder if he knows he's as special as he is and has that there's this many people that actually want to spend time around him and see him and go and kind of follow his progress. It must be an interesting thing for, you know, I doubt as a leopard he probably does. Maybe for him it's just, he just kind of sees it as, as the norm, which would be interesting, but...
Well, Aaron, who is a new viewer to Safari Live, wants to know about whether or not Hosanna, um, or how old Hosanna is firstly, and will he be the king of this area one day? Well, Will, we hope so. We hope that he will one day be the dominant male in our area and hopefully will one day be successful in taking over this entire section. That's the plan at least. Whether or not that happens, we're not quite sure. We obviously have to wait and see if he is going to get it right, but we're hoping so. In terms of his age, he's about two and a half years old now, so he's still a very young boy. He's got a long way to go until he's going to be in any way dominant in this particular area. But the one thing he's got on his side is that his dad, unfortunately, is getting a little bit long in the tooth. And so he has an opportunity, if he can just woo his dad and stay here for a few more months or weeks, um, or months probably, and years, then he's got an opportunity where he can potentially take over from his dad when his dad decides that he is a little bit too old and when he can no longer defend himself against intruding males like Hosanna. So it'll be pretty amazing when if he does take over. It's going to be a long stretch though. It will kind of, there's lots of, got, lots of things got to go in his favor before he'll be able to do that. But oof, that is spectacular. David, are you happy? So happy. David is so happy. That's always good news. When David is happy, then I'm happy. They say a happy cameraman is a happy life. And so one needs to keep their ha cameraman as happy as possible. Right. While, while that goes down, I'm going to send you back across to Steve with the beautiful Inkuma Pride. They are beautiful. They are flat. But we love them anyway. So heard a squirrel alarm calling that individual, that young male. So he popped his head up and down again. That was a lot of effort. Cow six, I think they probably would, the Kruger lions. I mean, they are the same species. They're just ge geographically separated. So they're the same species. I think pretty much everything about them is the same. Um, just, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what differences there would be about them. I don't know if there's a difference in average size between the two. When you go to the Kalahari, the lions there are exactly the same species, but yet they are a lot bigger. They are bigger than these lions. I don't know when I say a lot. I must look at the math, but they are a little bit bigger than these lions. Oh, he's... <laughs> it's yawning and um, so they would probably survive I mean the, all the traits that go with being a lion would get them through living in the Mara it's all they're very instinctive animals you know they know how to to compete they know how to to be a pride they know how to hunt the way they rear their cubs it's all very much the same sort of stuff um, they would just adapt to eating in bulk and then eating not so much in bulk as what happens in the Mara during the, the migration and then the off season. But that is similar to what happens here. We get the dry season where these animals take advantage of the weaker animals. And then in the wet season there is an abundance of animals but they're not as easy to catch or to find. So they generally feed on smaller prey animals. They just have to feed on more of them. But the competition, I think they would yeah, the Unkuhumas would love to go up there and interact with one of the larger clans of hyena. <laughs> Imagine that, Seb. You see how they behave to the hyena here. But the reality is the hyena here, when they see the Unkuhumas, they turn and run. Where up there, the hyena kind of back away a little bit, but they don't turn themselves. They sort of back up in a line and they form like a wall. And they move forward and come back and move forward and come back and move forward. And lions don't do very well with that. They want things to run away from them. And when they don't, well they lose their confidence that's why what we do with lions on foot is you stand your ground you don't turn and run you stand your ground you stare them in the eye you might say some very rude words but that is all to yourself you just have to apologize if you say anything too rude afterwards to your guests <laughs> sometimes if a lion surprises you you might shout something you you wish you hadn't have said but that is just what happens in in a moment of panic and the grooming has started folks <coughs> excuse me the grooming has started on one of the adult lionesses it looks like 
I'm, going, I'm trying to look around for amber eyes and I haven't seen her. Uh, there's, we can only count, what did we say? Nine, I said. Uh, yeah. We can only count nine lions here. Yesterday we could count ten. Uh, James counted eight this, or nine this morning. And then I think one of the other females was found trailing the pride, but never actually, never actually, I don't know if she made it here, but we haven't found her if she is. Do you count a tenth one? No, I'm counting ten, yeah. Okay, Seb's got a little bit more height than me, so now he's seeing a tenth one. Ah, oh, there we go, at the back. Yeah. Okay, so we haven't, I haven't seen Amber Eyes, and the youngest lioness as well, youngest adult lioness, haven't seen her. And Trist and I were discussing it over tea earlier. Because we're very civilized gentlemen, you see. We drink tea and we discuss things. And uh, we reckon, well, he, Tristan, he's been in the area a lot longer than I. He reckons one of them might be off mating with maybe the evoker males. It's possible that the, one of them was seen mating with the evokers just the other day. So that's interesting. Is it Amber Eyes or is it the youngest lioness of the adult females? Well, we'll keep checking to see if Amber Eyes is in fact here, but I didn't see her yesterday and I normally pick her out pretty quickly, but I haven't yet seen her. The youngsters are here. The boy is The oldest with the scar on her hip is here. But until they show us more than the side of their body, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to tell you very much more. The temperature has dropped quite a bit from earlier. Grooming has, as you can tell, stopped. That was a lot of effort. Kruger guy who love their ears. I love their paws. I think their ears are cool, but I absolutely love the feet of lions, especially when they stretch them. Um, that really, really cool time when Amber Eyes and the very small cub um, when the cub came up to her and gave her a bit of a bit of a scratch on the ear and she grabbed it and gave it this hug towards her body with those extended feet. That for me was really, really incredible. And there's a few very brave Franklin over there. Oh, they know they're faster than the lion. But just goes to show, Franklin don't alarm call for lions. You see that? Mm. See that? So we got, <laughs> if you're looking for lion, don't rely on the Franklin. That's what we rely on when we're looking for leopards. Well, it's one of the very good indicators. And also love it when lions lie upside down and reveal their chin, like the one just there on the left of the screen. You, you almost want to go scratch it, you know. You almost want to go and... Okay, she doesn't want... Oh, there we go. When they do that... Oh, she almost rolled onto her back. When they do that semi-rolled over sort of pose... And hug themselves. That to me is the best. I love that about lions. Okay, so the lioness with the the injured eye is here. So that's the two of the adults counted for. That is her there. Her right eye is just just a purple purple sheen. And I'm not not sure actually what happened to her eye. I'm, very likely it was a claw or something. Do you know what happened to her eye, Seb? Uh, no, I'm not sure. No. Not sure. But being in a pride hasn't seemed to have affect her, affected her in any way. See those photos of the Anderson male, a very powerful male leopard. Uh, his eye seems to have healed quite nicely and it was all an external injury. His um, eye is actually fine and just all the scar tissue or the, I think it was just like a boxer's sort of eye. He got an enormous cut on the top of his eye. No one really knows what happened. Well, no one that I've spoken to. When I saw a picture of him, I was asking a friend of mine down in Londolosi, and he said, yeah, well, the eye's opened again, and the eye's there, but it looks very, very wounded. But he can definitely see, and he's gonna have a very nice scar. MK, you like the brow lines of lions, their eyebrows, interesting. Um, I wonder, I mean, you've probably seen them on the on the show looking at you, but I wonder how much you would notice those brow lines if you were staring one down, standing on foot. I tell you, you don't see those brow lines. You see the eyes, that's for sure. The eyes stare straight through you. 
lion's eyes. They're very penetrating. Okay, well there's not too much action going on here. They're definitely hungry though. We don't know of them kill. <laughs> it's going to bite its foot. Oh, too much. That's a bit of a yawn. I'm so hungry I'm going to eat my sister's foot. Now that's just going to invoke a little bit of a... Okay, you want me to lick your face? I will lick your face. There we go. Oh, don't do that. Okay, well, anyway, Tristan seems to have caught up with Osana, so let's go and see what that little chief is up to. Well, Hosanna is on the move and moving quite quickly, and he's heading in an interesting way because he's kind of going south but not south. He's heading towards the old hyena den, but if he goes straight from the old hyena den, he's going to go to Treehouse Dam, in which case, well, then there's going to be a rendezvous with his dad. Where we are right now is, I don't know if any of you remember a few months ago, we were, in fact, it was during, was it Big Cat Week? I think it might have been Big Cat Week TV show when we did a drive where we had the swinging hyena on the impala head. Do any of you remember that? Yes, well that sighting, we are right where that was, so exactly where um, Tundi had killed that impala and where she had hoisted it into the tree and then the hyena came and jumped on it. Now you see, look, there's actually a fresh aardvark digging just to our right here that he stopped and looked at. You see all that digging out? So that's from an aardvark that would have dug that. And that's quite fresh, actually. That's from probably in the last couple of days, maybe even, I would say, even last night or the night before. The soil's quite dry, and, and it's, but it's definitely fresh, fresh soil. It's not from a long period ago. So that's quite interesting. You must keep an eye out on there. Might be quite cool to actually sometimes put camera traps at these kind of holes and see what actually happens. I wouldn't be surprised an aardvark comes out of there. Anyway, Hassan is at least, he's changed direction a bit now. Instead of heading so much south, he's now heading a little bit more to the east. And so I think he's not going to actually catch up with his dad unless he picks up his dad's scent and then follows it straight southwards from here but this is the Hosanna of old we used to find him here a lot and actually who used to find here more than anybody was Shungile which makes me a little bit sad it's getting to that day now where we have you know to remember that Shungile disappeared our last sighting of her I, I thought the 16th the other day was actually the 19th there was just an upside down six unfortunately so I just got it wrong but it's and it's it's always sad when I think about it so I can't actually believe it's been a year since we've seen her she was such a cool leopard and I can't imagine you know if Hosanna's grown up to be like this can you imagine what Shungile would have been like she would have just been the most relaxed most chilled awesome little leopard one could ever ask for where has he gone David, do you see him? Oh, there he is, around the termite mount. For a second there, I lost him completely. It's getting to that kind of light now where it's difficult to actually see. Well, Anna Marie, eye contact does intimidate a leopard on foot. So you do not engage with a leopard on foot. If you see a leopard and you want to, and you stare at it when you're walking, that's asking for a major, major problem. You're going to get yourself into a lot of trouble and you're going to probably end up being charged or either that or the leopard will run but you don't want to engage in eye contact on the vehicle it's a little different he doesn't quite see us as a threat on the vehicle and he's even though he knows we're here um, us watching him and kind of looking at him doesn't really worry him that much at all he's kind of gotten used to vehicles as not being something he needs to be too concerned about and he's quite used to the vehicles following him that he no longer really cares too much it's almost like essentially we could be a older sibling that's kind of following him and that's the way he kind of sees us so it's not as much as that he's fearful of us and we can look at him directly and maybe with the kind of size of the car and the fact that he grew up with it from an early age even though he picks up individuals because there's no one will tell me that a cat can't see an individual in a car they are have incredible eyesight so they know that there's something moving something around so you cannot tell me that that's not the case but I don't think that they see when we're sitting I don't think they can work out that we're a human that's actually watching them I think they see it more as kind of just this big object that drives around that they don't actually have to stress about so it's an interesting take but when you're in a car you, I mean I've sat and stared a leopard directly in the eyes at two meters away and had absolutely no difference in her, their behavior 
try to do that on foot and like I say you'll probably end up being clawed and scratched and being in a very bad place. I'm trying to get David a fairly decent view. There's quite a few sticks and branches here so we'll just try and sneak our way through. David there's a nice gap here. Just give me two seconds. There we go David. Are we good there? Cool. So stop there. So I'm going to have a bit of a grooming session and see. I'm trying to listen to the radio a little bit just to see if us kind of off-roading through here has maybe awoken Tingana to come in this direction. It doesn't seem like it has. Apparently he's still fairly dozy on a treehouse damn wall. I think if he's got a full belly at out he'll go too far at all. But Sanders has decided now it's time for a bit of a relax, time to clean himself and it's going to be interesting from here where he goes. I have a funny feeling he's going to go towards this drainage line off Ingwe Alley where we found him a few times and then from there it's all the way across back up the Mulwati back to his favorite spot at the dam. Is that what you're going to do Hosanna? Hmm? Maybe, maybe not. And you can see why he's difficult to find. We've followed him for quite a way now. We've, we've gone through a lot of uh, well, long distance and pretty much crossed only two roads and we didn't walk on one of those roads at all. We just crossed straight over both of them and so that's why he can be hard to find. You drive along now, there is not a chance that you would see this leopard from any of the roads that are around here. You would have had to have followed the tracks but following the tracks in bush like this would have been quite difficult and so he is a, not going to be an easy cat to track come summertime. And our sightings of him now are all based around the fact that he comes to water and we have a starting point to find him and from there we can then track him as well as dry conditions that allows us to be able to see his tracks fairly decently. Come summer when this gets all thick and, and lots of vegetation it's going to be a very tricky cat to find. He's not going to be nearly as easy. Well look at that flexibility. He's almost bent himself in half. Look at that. It's amazing. Imagine you trying to do that. Literally has bent himself in half. You can see his stomach is arching. Hosanna? The flexibility of youth. I doubt your dad would be able to do that. I think Tingana's gotten past that. He's now still in too big a sausage mode to actually bend in half like that. Now, we're going to show you on our flare just how warm Hosanna is and how hot his little tummy is. You see that? He's got his little poo bear tummy in a flare. So Winnie the Pooh kind of has this little tummy that he gets and it looks like osana has got one too. But very very hot between the back legs and the front legs where the, the kind of legs rub together. After walking for a while that does get quite warm. Shoulders will be warm, mouth and face. Um, even the ears are quite hot at this time of the day. You can see where he's been lying, how hot he is. Even the patch on the ground stays hot. Pretty cool isn't it to see this flare in action. Now you see he's sniffing around. I wonder if he hasn't picked up the scent now of where Tingana walked. You see, look at his nose down to the ground. Definitely sniffing. Maybe he's caught the scent of whoever else was here and that's why he just stopped for a bit and now he's going to investigate. Is he Fleming grimacing? No, not yet. Now he's looking up into the trees. Osana? What's your plan? Right, Osana is moving again. He's going the way he came funny enough and so while we try and figure out what he's actually going to get up to he's looking in all the trees so I wonder if he's picked up a scent let's send you back across to Steve and see if his lions are going to decide to move at any point during the course of today well maybe they will and maybe they won't as James likes to say two minutes or 30 seconds before the end of show bless you whoever that was someone sneezed <laughs> two minutes or 30 seconds before the end of show they will um, suddenly get up but there's been a bit more yawning and a bit more grooming there hasn't been a single toilet stop yet though Lit Piano, you want to know how much food lions eat a day? Well, they can eat many kilograms of food every single day. Sorry, we've just got some very strange vehicles decided to just drive in. I don't think they're allowed to be here. Don't know who they are. Tourist vehicles are just driving in for some reason. Um, a lion can eat in one sitting up to 30 kilograms of meat. So um, an adult male, maybe even 40 kilograms. Some people say a third of their weight. 
So that's an enormous amount, almost 50 kilograms of meat in one sitting. Um, that is if they catch it, but then they can also go for weeks without eating. So it really depends on the day, what they catch, and when you're in a pride like this, you have to share it, and the biggest and strongest will eat and share with no one. That individual in the middle of the picture is becoming bigger and stronger than most, and he is not sharing any of his food. If anything, he is taking more than he should, but that will make him a big, strong male. A little bit more movement. A couple more heads up. And as we say that, he closes his eyes. Mm. Another little cat nap. Well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. We're going to get some play here, are we? Looks like there's going to be some play. Up he is. Beautiful cat stretch there. Oh, isn't that beautiful? You can see the size comparison between him and his sister. He's a lot bigger. I don't know who these people are, Megs. I'm going to have to have a word with them about why they are just driving into Juma. Don't think they know the property, private property rules. Anyway, we have got our lions and they are slowly starting to wake up. And while we try and figure out what's going on over here, let's go back over to Tristan. Well, good luck, Steve. Good luck figuring things out. You can see Hosanna is just off on my right-hand side. He was about to cross over, and then he just decided to turn. But he's sniffing around. We're at the old hyena den, so some of you may recognize where we are at the moment. We're in this old kind of area, and I'm trying to see if I can find any tracks on the road here that indicates another leopard has walked here, because he was walking southwards, I mean northwards again, back towards the dam area. There we go. You see his Fleming grimacing. He's picked up the scent now of whichever leopard this was and he got to the top of that mound and all of a sudden he's just changed and came back north again. So he's definitely smelt something. I can't see any tracks. Look, look at the nose to the ground. How cool is this? This is how he finds animals himself. So we use our eyesight. He uses his nose and his eyes and everything else to pick up whoever this may be. Very cool to watch. I want to go forward a little bit and see if actually there's some tracks there that we can see and see if we can physically see anything or if it's all just a chemical signature that's been left behind. But if he's sprayed there, there should theoretically be some indication of a footprint. So Hosanna was there. Now, I've also I've got to be careful because I don't want to use Hosanna's tracks. Is there another leopard track there? Difficult to say. Sorry, Darby, I'm in your way. can't see any other leopard tracks. It just looks like... Hosanna's tracks, you can see there, there's a track there and a track at the other side that all look like they're for him. So I don't see where any other leopard has maybe scent marked or walked. Although, maybe, maybe Tingana's tracks are here. There's quite a few tracks, so he's obviously up and down, so it's a bit difficult to actually see. But he's definitely going back now the way we've just come. We've literally just driven that exact path. He walked from there this way, and now we're going back again. So who knows what Hosanna is thinking, but he's got his nose to the ground, and so I'm intrigued now as to following him, what we're going to come across, and whether or not he's now going to follow towards where Tingana was. It's just his tracks that I can see. Careful there, David. There's a very sharp, thorny tree, so I'll go over these dead trees, rather. So, Lady Starfire, um, it's now actually, now that it's warming up, we should start seeing a little bit more snake activity, should start seeing things starting to move a little bit. It's still a bit early in the season for things like tortoises and chameleons, but it is starting to get very warm now, which means that I would imagine we should start seeing snakes' movement and tracks fairly shortly in the next few weeks. I think we would potentially start getting those kind of signs 
of them moving around and actually being in this area. So it would be nice to see some snakes. It's been a long time since I've seen a snake actually. It would be nice. I would really want to see a python again. I don't know why I haven't seen pythons in so long that I would quite enjoy seeing a python if I'm honest. It would be very nice to kind of find out how many pythons we have on this area. And then there's nothing like a big python. It's a scary thing to see when you see a five meter long python. But it is an amazing animal. It is huge. It is powerful and very, very, very clever. And I often find them lying in wait on pathways for animals to come past and then they launch and grab them. And, you know, a big python's taking down a fully grown impala, much like what Hosanna would. So it gives you an idea of just how powerful those big pythons are. Now, what have you seen, Hosanna? Because you're kind of slinking. He gets slinky when he's spotted something. So we'll see where he's slinking off to. Sounds like Steve's with the lions and they have decided to move. Surprise, surprise. Well, 15 minutes before the end of show, <laughs> they got up and they've started moving. But the problem is, is that they are facing south. That is, you can see it in the background. That is Gowrie Main in the far, in the sort of middle back corner there. With the electric pole. There it is. Two of the lionesses, one of the adults and a youngster, have got up and have moved. The rest have not moved far. We're all sort of puddling together where we left them. And there is a game viewer waiting on the main road for them to come. I don't know who these people were that just came in. They just had private vehicles and decided they would come in and have a look at some lions. You can see this youngster is sitting on... Um, on the tur on the the burnt patch which of the fire break, you can see this. It's a little bit dark underneath. Hello, lit piano. Well, lions can live for, you know, about 15 years, maybe 16 years. Females, depending on you know on conditions and on competition. Here we go. It's coming back. The one just behind it is coming back. These are two youngsters. They're not going to lead the charge. If anything, it's going to be the adults. Uh, males can live up to about 10, maybe 12, but that's a bit old. You know, males fight. Once a male doesn't have tenure on a pride, he becomes a nomad, and for him to stay alive is a very tricky business. The reason why females can stay alive a bit longer. Let me move up here, Sid. I can get these lionesses up here. Sorry about that. Our females can live a bit longer because they have the support of the pride and the pride will kind of look after them, so to speak. But the males, once they are, once they've lost their ability to look after the females, well, they're all but, all but on their own. Here we go, as we watch these two adults stop and have some ablutions. Here we go. Okay, this is the female with the injured eye. This is pretty common place for lions. They'll get up, have a yawn, a bit of a groom, and then a toilet stop. Part and parcel of lion movement. And the wind direction is perfect for us as we watch them move past our vehicle. Sorry, Seb, I've got my foot on the brake. I'm going to release it quickly. Oh, sorry about that, my mistake. Here is the youngest lion is about to come. So I'm guessing that Amber Eyes is the one that is missing and is mating. There they go. The boy right up in front. He is hungry. He wants some of the food. Wherever it is that they go. In the trajectory that they're moving on, and they'll probably hit the Chitra watering hole if they do keep moving in this direction. I'm going to let the, the people on that side know about it in a moment of course Michelle you think they can all hunt now yes well I hope they can we're gonna move around now in a second try to get them in the in the drainage line let me just move back here there's the fire break and the drainage line. We still have a road we can access down here. There's a vehicle waiting very patiently 
are two vehicles waiting very patiently for these lions to pop out. Everybody likes to see the lions, so obviously I don't want to impede them. I'm not going to do with what some people have been known to do and park in the way of the lion. I'm going to let them come and go as they please. There is the, the fire break lion that we have. And there are the lions. You might see some lights on them now. They're probably going to walk on our fire break. They're having a little bit of a smell. They love to come in and out at exactly this spot here. They love to come in and out. This is often where we like to check for tracks to see where they've gone. This is the Umawati drainage that goes all the way up to camp, all the way back to Vuitelepan, all the way back to where Hosanna loves to hang out. And every time we've had the Birminghams come through, they've basically just meandered straight down this drainage all the way down to Mala Mala. So it's quite a prominent drainage line. Obviously it's dry this time of year. There's a seasonal pan, a seasonal river. I haven't, I didn't see it run this year. It must run from time to time. But these river systems, even though they are dry, are what sustain life in the savannah. Provide the, the, the shelter and the food. Barbara, as far as I'm aware, lions are the only social cat. The rest of them are solitary. And lions have evolved to be um, social because the savannah ecosystem is the youngest in the world. And uh, what happened basically is climate change. Watch, he's going to stalk. Here we go. Didn't see it coming. <laughs> Lots of play happening now. Because Savannah is the youngest ecosystem, it came about through climate change. The climate change led to reduced uh, rainfall, which led to the, the, op the system opening up and forests diminishing and moving to sort of more what we have savannah, some more grassland ecosystems with trees. And with that, more sunlight on the ground, which produced more grass. Uh, and then the grassland system produced much larger herbivores much larger herbivores then also accumulated in, 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 in groups and that required larger pr predators to pull them down, not just one cat like a leopard. There's a niche for wildebeest and buffalo and giraffe that no individual would ever be able to tackle really on their own. Although lions do take wildebeest and zebra on their own, sometimes it is a big risk. Okay, well, these lions are walking along the fire break. They're about to cross, it seems, in a southerly direction towards Little Gowrie, and it seems like the little chief is not the only social cat. Well, the little chief is mobile very steadily straight towards Tingana. In fact, I can actually see the lights of where the vehicle is with Tingana. He's right in front of us. So, Hosanna on my right hand side, right there, and Tingana is on the dam wall of Treehouse Dam, which is 150 meters, 100 meters from where we are right now. So, we're about to get them together. Now, we are going to switch into IR. We lost too much light now to actually see the two of them. Now, I wonder if Hosanna can see Tingana if he's going to change course but we are going to need to like i say just flick it into ir because otherwise it's going to be a little bit tough to actually keep following him now there we go so he's in infrared now i'm going to keep up with hosanna like i say tingana is just off on my left hand side you'll just see in the distance there the lights are there so that light that you see there that's where tingana is sitting currently on top of a damn wall so i'm wondering if tingana one is going to come to us or if hosanna has seen tingana already and is just going to sit on the mound and this is the further south we've seen T hosanna go or southwest should i say and i hope this is not an indication of him moving back towards kind of londos and those areas i'll be very sad if Hosanna does end up crossing out because he bumps into Tingana here and it will be a very bleak day for me that's for sure. I just thoroughly enjoyed having little Hosanna around. So Painted Wolf you say you're excited for a reunion well we're going to have to wait. The little chief has decided it's what time to wait. I'm gonna try and see no he's not waiting he's going to move now. I don't know if he knows what he wants to do I think he's maybe spotted Tingana already because he stopped. I can't see Tingana myself. I think he's on the damn wall 
of Treehouse. So let's see. There, now he's spotted. I think he's now spotted Tingana. You see how his whole body changed there for a second? He just perked his head up and started looking. So, sorry, I'm going to turn off my lights, David, otherwise. Now, he's definitely walking as though he doesn't really care. He's certainly looking in that direction. All right, let's get onto the road, David. We're going to try and get onto the road, which will help David be able to see because it should then be by Hosanna between us and Tingana rather than the other way around. That was... Oof, it's bumpy though. So I'm trying to also drive without lights because I don't want to give Hosanna away too much. Where is he now? There he is. So Treehouse Dam is right in front of us. Let's see now. I just want to check. There we go. He's just off to my left hand side behind a lot of this bush. He's just stopped and watching. And I think once he figures out that it's Tingana, maybe he'll start to move. towards the dam but for now we've got a hiatus where he's just stopped and is watching and analyzing I think he's spotted that there's another leopard here the eyesight is so good and there's a light on Tingana so it would be much easier for him to spot Tingana rather than Tingana spotting him because he's obviously not seeing a light we're not shining lights on Tingana on Hosanna but we are bouncing through the bush would I suppose would help with being able to now I do apologize when I start you'll hear a rattling it's because our aerial is slightly loose and so there's a rattling sound that's coming from the back so if you hear it my apologies it is very noisy I know but there's not much we can do about it right now and hopefully things will stay connected before we actually end up finishing this drive and we don't lose anything but he's going down he's heading straight towards where Tingana is. There's Tingana. I can see Tingana on the damn wall now. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to probably extend the show and we're going to just take this to all of our various platforms because well, it should be quite an interesting meetup between the two. So I'm just going to hold off speaking for now and then we'll hopefully see the two of them come together. Alright, so we're still waiting just to sort out a few little tech things to try and kind of figure it out. But in the meantime, we are going to, like I say, extend the show. We were supposed to close fairly shortly, but we'll just keep going until we see the kind of interaction between the two of them. And hopefully we will get both of them coming through. Tingana's still down. He's not actually standing up. He's lying on the damn wall quite far from here. Hosanna's just watching. You can see he's kind of looking down towards the dam itself. So let's see whether or not... He's going to walk down. I'm not sure if he is. Tingana's very, very, very flat, so it's quite difficult to see him. It was only when we saw a light. So, Michelle, you say woohoo, and a lot of you are very excited for the meeting of a father and son. I'm not really in that same boat. I'm, every time they meet, it could be a potential last time. If you maybe think about but Tingana on a bad day decides, no, I don't want to tolerate Osana here, and could very well chase him at some point it's going to happen uh, well it should theoretically happen in some sort of time and without food maybe just maybe Tingana kind of pushes him away it's also a different scenario to what we normally see we normally see Hosanna at a pan Tingana arriving and so Tingana is the one making the choice if Hosanna just arrives I don't know if Tingana is going to be that thrilled to see him and well, it'll be interesting reaction and, and like I say I hope this is not going to mean that Tinga Hosanna gets pushed south into Dilgari or west back into Arethusa I hope this means that he sees Tingana and then pushes back north 
towards the dam cam that's what i'm hoping it's obviously a lot of variables involved in this and so he's kind of part of me thinks i hope this is not the last time that he has meets up with Tingana and Tingana finally decides this is not tolerable anymore. But let's see. And so far Asana doesn't look too and well too perturbed and Tingana's definitely still fast asleep, so it's not really anything to worry about just yet. But he is gonna move. Now let's see what's going to happen here. Slowly making his way down. I wonder if he's going to go lie at his favorite spot, which is this termite mound directly in front of us. He is heading straight towards it, so I wouldn't be surprised if he does go towards the termite mound. There he goes, coming over the road. Hosanna, this is a bit of deja vu seeing you back at Treehouse Dam. Been a long time since I've seen you here. There he goes. Kruger guy, he is a focused cat, and it's a serious business being Hosanna. You, you know, as much you've got to try hard to be goofy and to look around and to pose like that. I mean, this is just ridiculous. Of all the places you would think, he's literally come up and he's standing right there, staring straight at us in the best possible pose you could ever imagine. Hosanna, you're a show cat, is what you are. He is focused, though. He does look, he does stare, he keeps his ears kind of there and amazing his senses to think that he's picked up Tingana just from a scent that was probably from last night. Remember Tingana left the pan last night or early hours of this morning and he's followed that by, by his nose all the way to this dam is pretty impressive. I think he thinks maybe there's a carcass around. Look how he's smelling. He's just sniffing and trying to see what's going on. I think he thinks maybe there's food somewhere here and his nose is very accustomed to finding food that's for sure. Just kind of staring off. Now let's see what's going to happen here. You can see there's Steve in the background driving along. You can see his light. So that's where the Inkuuma Pride was, way, way, way off in the distance. Maybe, maybe a little bit south of that. Might not be Steve actually, but it looks like Steve's lights um, coming down. Yes, and he has gotten massive, hasn't he? He's, he's much bigger than what. If you remember a year ago now he's chasing wants to chase Egyptian geese you can't chase Egyptian geese now Hosanna you've got to watch out for your dad <laughs> now he's gonna come our way and walk back towards us what have you found there okay so he's going the opposite direction now which is interesting it's almost like he's smelt something There he goes, just coming past us, and I'm not sure what's going to happen. I just want to see if he's going to come round the back of me, because this goes down towards the dam. There's a path behind me that goes down towards the dam. I just want to quickly see where he's going. David, is he still right behind us? So David, there's Tingana. Now, I don't know if, David, if we can just get a shot of Tingana across the dam wall from where Hosanna is. There he is. There. There's Tingana. You can just see it's on the dam wall. There we go. So there's Tingana sitting on top there, watching now Hosanna walking away. So he's now picked up. Here we go. Here comes Tingana now. So Tingana's coming to see who is this. Now, I wouldn't be surprised we hear a big call coming out of Tingana shortly. Now, Hosanna, be careful, boy, because Hosanna has no idea that Tingana is now strolling behind him. Look, Tingana's going to start salivating. I wouldn't be surprised we start to see salivation coming. You can see he's still very full. But this is amazing. How incredible is this afternoon that we've had? We've got, not only have we had elephants, we've had lions, and now we've got two leopards, and it's a father-son, and they might come together, which is going to be interesting. Now, Tingana, you need to be nice to your boy. If you come here, you need to be nice. You can't go and chase him. That's the only rule that we've got here. Now, we'll just wait for Tingana to come. I don't want to be between... I don't want to be between Tingana and Hosanna. I want them to, to have nothing obstructing their way and I don't want to be the one that kind of gets in between this reunion but Tingana you can see takes it seriously he's seen another leopard he probably knows in after spending time in this area that there is the scent of Hukumuri still lingers here and maybe he just thinks a part of him thinks hang on a second is that Hukumuri that's walking here I need to go and investigate this look at how he's ominously coming through the, the darkness with those glowing eyes 
Painted Wolf, he does look serious and mad, doesn't he? He looks as though he means business. And so I think it's more just he doesn't know who this is. As soon as he knows who it is, I think it'll relax a little bit. He might send a very clear message, but he's going to come and smell where he was standing. Look, you see, he's going straight to the same termite mound. Now he's going to sniff, and Tingana will walk right past us. But look at the size difference in the head and neck. You saw Hasana when he was standing there when he came up the road. He definitely was much smaller than what you see from Tingana. Tingana has got a serious weight and size advantage still. But he's sniffing heavily around there now. Hopefully he recognizes that as, as Hosanna and doesn't worry too much. Jay, you say, oh, you love this family drama. It, it is insane, isn't it? It just doesn't get any better. We've just had one thing after another with this family. And it's been pretty much since I've arrived at, at Safari Live, there's just been drama nonstop with our leopards. It's gone back and forth. We've had Karula disappear. We've had all kinds of things go on. And for this to still kind of be a drama unfolding has been quite spectacular. And we've been more than fortunate to witness this and to actually know what's kind of what's been able to watch what's playing out in a very very interesting family dynamic it's the most i've ever seen leopards spend time together is here i've never seen these kind of interactions like we've seen over the past few months it's absolutely fascinating now watch tingana when he's sniffing it's, oh, it's going to be difficult now because he's gone onto the mound but you can actually see his nose breathing out and heating the ground as he was doing it tingy see he's starting to salivate now he's smelling See, the, see his breath? Look at his breath on the termite mount. No, sorry, Megs, if you can just repeat that for me. I was too excited to see him actually heating the ground with his breath. So, Robert, yes, please, we don't want him to hurt his son at all, which would be very, very, very unfortunate if he did. But look how that belly is swaying as he comes past. So exactly the same line Hosan has just taken with us. There goes Tingana. Isn't that ridiculous? In the space of two, well, ten minutes, we've had two male leopards walk past within inches of our vehicle. It doesn't get better than that, and it certainly is one of the few places in the world where you'll ever, ever experience this kind of behavior. So we are exceedingly lucky that we get to spend time in a place like this, and to be able to follow these leopards is very, very, very special. Now, we are going to have to play a game of leapfrog with the other vehicles that are here, so I just want to see. I'm going to try and see where Hosanna is. I can't see Hosanna anymore. He's moved up the road the last i saw him he was just going up ahead and around that corner tingana seems like he can still see him look tingana's head is up he's kind of focused and you see tingana is also walking not quite as fast as he can walk and the reason for that is that tingana is also gingerly stepping this out because he's not 100 percent sure who's in front of him he's smelt now he probably thinks it's wasana but maybe he just wants to double check and make a hundred percent sure i can't see any sign of any other leopard besides Tingana in front of me. There doesn't seem to be any sign of Hosanna. Dave, can you see anything with your flare? Mm. No, there's, there's Hosanna. He's in right in front. Look, they can see each other now. Now they're coming together. Hosanna's walking straight at Tingana. Look at this. This is insane. Hosanna is just walking at him as though nothing. Tingana's actually rolled on his side, and that's almost like submissive behavior. That is. I mean, he did scent mark, which is obviously the dominant part of this, but when leopards roll like this, it's often in a submissive way, and Hosanna has just walked straight at him as though he doesn't care at all. This is ridiculous. Look at that. Two leopards in the same sighting. How amazing is this? Look, he's coming closer. Look, he's chuffing, he's chuffing. Oh, my goodness. This is incredible. I've got goosebumps. I didn't expect Osana to be this brave coming towards Tingana. Listen. He's calling like he would call to a cub or to his mom. That is amazing. That is a very soft kind of contact call. Now, there are other vehicles, so you will see a light. Unfortunately, unlike us who have got IR and thermals, nobody else does. And so they need a light to see what's going on. It's dark now. It's almost black. But Tingana has rolled over like a puppy and is just letting Hosanna walk straight towards him. This is astonishing. Hold on, David. I'm just going to move slightly. 
this is ridiculous. I have never seen two leopards lie this close as males and not in any way fight with one another. What is going on with these two? This is ridiculous. Can you believe this? I am at a loss for words. Patrick, you say you've got goosebumps too? This is... I, I don't know what to say. Hosanna, what are you doing? Now, Tingana's just saying, you're getting too close now. You, it's okay that you're here, but you're getting too close now. You need to just stop where you are. You can't come any closer than what you are. And Hosanna is making a very different sound. Do you hear the deep guttural growl that Tingana makes? There's the dominant individual. His tail is twitching quite a bit, which indicates he's not exactly impressed. But Hosanna is making more kind of cub-like call. He's showing his teeth a little bit, but it's very interesting. Look at this. Look at this. Tingana's just walking away. What is going on with these two? Wow. Look at the size difference though. Tingana is a beast in comparison to Hosanna. It's gonna get, he'll get there. I mean, he's obviously going to grow. But this is just unbelievable. I can promise you this race is one of my most insane sightings of leopard, just from a behavior point of view. Listen. So that is Tingana just stamping his foot down saying, I am dominant here, Hosanna, you're welcome to follow me, but I am the dominant male. And here he comes. Hosanna, how do you do this? How do you get these boys to like you? I, I'm baffled. I absolutely am baffled by this. Who would have thought? This is not the most ridiculous thing. This is so awesome. Hold on. Now they're going down... They're going down to the water hole. Are they going to drink side by side? That's the only thing I want to see. So we're going to just try and extend just a little bit longer, if you don't mind, Megs, because I want to see if these two are going. Because if they drink side by side, then I'm done. I'm flat floored by the behaviour of these two. Then I think I might just have to retire because I'll have seen most things to do with a leopard. But that's just insane. I actually cannot believe what we've just seen. The way that. Hosanna has just walked up to Tingana and Tingana has not done anything. He was more submissive than he was. I mean, look at this. We've got two leopards walking together. I mean, Hosanna's sitting on the road now. Tingana's walking down towards the water. They're going to go drink. And whether or not Hosanna's going to join him, I am really not quite sure. It looks like Hosanna might come down and drink with him. If he does, I will be absolutely flabbergasted. Here comes Tingana, he's going to drink right here. So I'm just going to quickly turn the car so that we've got a nice view of him drinking. So, sorry. Teddy Bear Hosanna is the real rule breaker. He is just on another level when it comes to all of this stuff. I honestly, I don't actually really know what else to say. I mean, he's just doing stuff that I would never have expected from a leopard. I honestly can say that had this been said this is going to happen to me before, I would have said to you there's no ways. And, well, as it's turned out, I mean, this is just ridiculous. There is seriously something another leopard. What it is, I don't know, but he has somehow wormed his way into the heart of these leopards and just seems to be able to do it. I don't really know what it is about him. But how great is this? This is just next level good. Now you can see in the thermal he's busy drinking. Hosanna's coming up behind him. Let's see if the two of them are going to lie side by side and drink. Because if that happens, like I said, I'm going to just stop everything and I'll probably retire. There's Hosanna just to the left of him. Tingana carrying on drinking. This guy's is just... I have no words for this. Look at this. Hassan's walking around like he doesn't care. He's just... he's completely happy to be the one in the limelight and just to say, well, guys, this is how I roll. This is what I get up to. So, it's... I don't know. There's not much more we can say. 
There goes Hosanna. What's he chasing after? He's just running after something. Unfortunately, it looks like he might end up going southwards, which is not good news. That's not what I wanted. Although he's lying down now. But there is, and it's just literally crazy. I want to know what all your thoughts are. One word tweet. It's a good time. Hashtag Safari Live. What do you think? I'm now at a loss for words, pretty much. You can see Tingana's a thirsty boy, so he's just going to drink himself into... until he's finished, and then I wonder if he's going to walk off and head off towards... Cap, you say your one-word tweet is awesome? Well, I think that's seriously understated. Yes, this is... Far, I mean, it is awesome. I suppose it is as good as one could get. Now, you might hear a lot of cameras in the background. There's a photographic group that is around, so they will be taking quite a bit of photos and getting quite a few images of Tingana drinking. It's quite a sought after. Dina, you say your one word is astonished. Well, Dina, I think you and me both. I, like I said to you just now, I don't really have words for what's going on here. How these two have tolerated each other the way that they have is absolutely astounding I mean, it's ridiculous Julie you say goosebumps well I think we all got goosebumps when Hosanna walked down the road at Tingana like that for me that was just the most spectacular thing that I have seen Carol you say no words well Carol I think all of us are in the same boat at this stage it really is been a spectacular. Now, is he going to call? That's just him telling Hosanna, listen, I'm the boss of this game. Well, guys, I think on that note, with Tingana making that call and Hosanna lying down and Tingana kind of wandering off, I think that's where we're going to leave it. Look at the reflection in that water as he walks along the bank. That is spectacular. So we're going to, like I say, finish up here. I mean, we can't ask for anything more than what we've just been given. So we're going to just leave it at that. And we're going to basically say good night because whew, I don't think it gets any better than that at all. We've really been absolutely spoiled. Now he's gonna go behind a car, unfortunately. So I do apologize about seeing the people and him. But it's been great, like I say, we've had lions, we've had leopard, we've had another leopard, we've had interaction, we've had Ellie's, we've had it all this afternoon. It's been spectacular from Juma once again. And so from Steve and myself, it's been seriously a great pleasure to have you all with us. Hopefully we'll see you all tomorrow morning to see how our drama played out for the Sunrise Safari.